Το... Ωραία. Sorry, να ρωτήσω κάτι, έπρεπε στα αγγλικά η παρουσίαση ή στα ελληνικά που είναι κάπου. Ναι, στα αγγλικά η παρουσίαση. Δεν σε αναφέρει κανένα. Οκ, εσύ. Τα σλάζει στα αγγλικά. Ναι, μπορεί να. Τα σλάζει δηλαδή είναι στα ελληνικά. Ναι, ναι. Δεν πειράζει. Να τα λέω στα αγγλικά. Εντάξει. Εσύ κύριε Φραγκούλη, είναι στα αγγλικά ή στα ελληνικά. Αγγλικά, αγγλικά. Εντάξει, οκ. Έμπειρα, θα το κάνουμε έτσι ένα υβριβικό σχήμα για την κυρία Λιώνα. Οκ. Switching to English now. Uh, I would like to welcome all to the second day of the first online school on smart data processing and systems of Deep Insight, which is organized by the Cyprus University of Technology uh, in the context of the Destiny Twinning Project. Uh, our presentations for today start with our friends and colleagues from the uh, Cyprus Telecommunication Authority. Uh, we were going to have two talks. One, uh, it's an introduction to 5G, uh, which will be presented by Mrs. Niki Ioannou from the Department of Business Solutions, uh, CETA Business. And uh, the second one is entitled Introduction to Smart Cities, the Nicosia Use Case, Uh, which will be delivered by Mr. Pandelis Frangoulis uh, from the Department of CIDA Sales and Business Development uh, and Vertical Markets. So uh, I think uh, Mrs. Ioannou will start first. So uh, the mm -hmm. floor is yours. Just share your screen. Uh, and uh, as soon as we see your presentation, I will give you... Yes, you can now put it in uh, presentation mode. Just one second. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would like to apologize because I didn't know it was in English, so I, I have it in Greek, but I, will, I, I can, uh, I mean, I can, um, uh, I can talk about it in, in English and, uh, and maybe, um, maybe, I don't know if you're sharing the presentations. Uh, yes, we are going to share the presentations. Uh, all the presentation will be uploaded uh, in a dedicated uh, shared uh, folder. So uh, before sending us your presentation, please translate your uh, slides into, into English. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. thank you very much. Right. The floor is yours. Okay, so we're talking about 5G, which is the fifth uh, generation of um, mobile uh, telephony. Um, people say that 5G is uh, creating the, the new industrial revolution. And uh, let's go ahead and see why Um, I mean, how did we come to 5G and why 5G is, is such a game changer? Um, everything started with 2G, right? When we had the, the, the regular phone, we were able to make calls and send SMS. After, after uh, 2G, we have 3G, which we, is the first time we had access to the internet via our mobile phone. And then came 4G and we all got connected and we all got hooked up to being uh, connected to the internet and sharing data and being part of the social, uh, uh, social uh, groups of people, um, sharing applications and, and really having the mobile phone as our um, access to the world. So, um, so we, we, if, we, if we think that um, 2G we started working and 3G we started running, then 5G is like we're, we're on a rocket. So this is how fast 5G is. is. So let's see the specifics of 5G. Everybody says that 5G is a game changer and that because of 5G, our whole lives will change and the way we understand the world and the way we work in this world will change as well. So the main elements of 5G, of course, is speed. Everybody knows it. In 4G, we had around 20 to 35 um, um, megabits per second. In 5G, we have around 200 megabits per second. So it's like 10 times the speed that we used to have. So the other, the, the reason why we need all this speed is because um, if you imagine that there's um, there's um, there's six point there's five point uh, um, yes there's three point six six three billion users of the internet and. 92% of them use their phone to access the internet. You understand why we need high speed. And um, you can see how the, um, the, the mobile 
phone is becoming the, the means to access the internet, we can see the increase in mobile data consumption and the average, um, for, for a regular user, the average um, monthly usage of data is around 9.4 gigabit compared to how low it used to be in, in, two, in 2015. So everybody's using their mobile phone to access the internet. 5G is more secure than any other um, network we had. It's inherent in the network. The, the major aspect of 5G is the low latency. Um, I mean, if you, if you, everything works like in real time, and that means that every, any application that you want to use, you can access the information in real time. So that creates a huge, um, a huge amount of um, applications that you can use over 5G. Um, the increased um, capacity of 5G, uh, we used to have uh, 100,000 devices on 4G and it's one, 1 million devices per kilometer in, in 5G. So you understand how many devices you, we can have. And this is very important because of the IoT. In IoT, it is expected that in 2020, around 50 billion uh, devices will be connected to the internet. And 5G is actually the only network that can, um, uh, that can um, allow us to have that, that much devices connected. So one of the other features of the 5G is the reliability and stability. That means that even if you have a lot of users connected at the same time, everybody gets to have quality of service, which is a very important issue on the mobile networks. So this is just a, a statistics for 5G. We can see that um, there's 140 networks, 5G networks around the um, globe right now. And almost 23 countries out of the 27 in, in EU um, use 5G. Um, there's 20, um, 20, there's 220 million um, users connected to the 5G networks. And there's more than 150 devices now that are 5G enabled. So that means that the whole world is going to 5G. So I, Cyprus has to go as well. Um, this is just a slide that shows that every industry will be um, helpful. 5G will be helpful for every industry. And let's see a number of industries that are really game changers. Um, the education and entertainment are really changing because of 5G. Um, the video is becoming the king. I mean, the, the major, the, the application that we see that's consuming the internet is the video, especially uh, video streaming. And we can see that everybody's now using streaming for their entertainment. They, 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 they see their favorite movies, their favorite series on their mobile phones. I have three kids and all of them, they have three different media streams. They have Netflix, they have Hulu, they have Disney and they see everything on their mobile phone. So 5G is an enable and 5G allows us to go for virtual reality and augmented um, artificial reality. So they're, they're estimating that around 300 a million devices of virtual reality will be um, uh, will be allocated to the market by 2025. So you can understand how many people are going to be using these applications. Um, we can see that the major players in the entertainment industry are really trying to see how they're going to use 5G so they can um, engage the market. And um, of course, the video, as I said before, is the number one um, usage media. Um, really, um, I think it's 20% extra usage per month compared to the rest of the um, ways of communicating with people. Um, so for the school, I mean, augmented reality and virtual reality is gonna be the key in um, engaging um, uh, students to um, understand better the, the material they have to understand and to really um, engage in the learning process. And I have a short video of how this has been used um, It's in English, so don't worry. Maybe you can uh, increase the volume in your computer somehow because we do not hear anything.
Sorry. We, we still don't uh, hear anything. So if you if you like to make some comments here and there, maybe it will be better. You cannot you cannot hear it. No, no, it's uh, it's too uh, low. I, I, you, no, you know what? Um, okay, let me just. Uh, there's a click. I I just saw it. I didn't see it before. That is share video share audio as well. So okay, let me just. Allows for a completely it. seamless, yeah. low latency, highly immersive learning experience for our students. The new 5G, the 5G standalone, is a completely new network, independent from 4G, relying on a completely independent 5G architecture. When I first heard about the 5G standalone network being installed in the university, that was really exciting because the possibility for learning that it brings with clinical degrees like mine. So we've just done a remote learning lesson with the VR learning experience app and it was absolutely amazing. We could see all different parts of the human body without actually having to be there. So even without the COVID crisis, we live in a global learning community and what 5G allows us to do is to take the learning to the students wherever they are, anywhere around the world. I really like the fact that you can just sit there and the lecturer will go through every single part with you rather than just sitting at home and going through notes and things like that. Sorry, Natasha, can you go through that again for me, please? Obviously with the VR stuff, it's a lot better to learn for because obviously for visual learners, it will help them sort of learn a lot easier than if people can't read off of a book or something like that. The virtual reality anatomy session allows the lecturer to take the student through a journey through the body. At the very large levels, so looking at the brain, the heart, the lungs, through to the very smallest part, such as the cells inside the blood vessels. Basically, when you're using the VR headset, if you're standing there and a red blood cell's coming towards you, it'll put it off its path. So it's as if you're actually within the bloodstream. So obviously, you know, knowing the body inside and out enables me to make decisions out on the road that positively affect people. When you're learning to be a nurse, it feels like you can't really make mistakes when you're on placement. But to be able to have VR means that you feel almost comfortable to show what you can do, because if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. And your lecturers can be there watching and telling you what went wrong afterwards. Applications like remote surgery, remote monitoring of equipment and machinery, remote diagnostics can avail themselves of this ultra reliable low latency. So 5G allows us to do things we haven't done before. This technology has amazing potential. So this is just the first step on what we hope is a very long and very exciting journey. So, um, so it's not just, um, I mean, this experience that we saw that the, the, the students will get. And I think that in the years to come, it's going to be a differentiator. I mean, students will be choosing universities and, and schools based on what uh, they can, um, what, uh, um, what applications they have using this artificial intelligence and artificial um, uh, uh, learning capabilities. But also, as we said, 5G allows for massive con connectivity. So that means that, you know, in, in an area of a school that so many people are hungry for data, it becomes applicable and nobody, everybody's using it without having to share um, the, the capacity. And also, of course, about uh, security and um, management on the buildings. Because of this uh, high capacity of 5G, it can, we can connect all those devices and have a very environmental friendly um, university um, buildings and security. So in, eventually, I mean, 5G talks about the smart education environment. It talks about smart buildings, smart, uh, um, smart factories, everything becomes smart. The reason why we say everything becomes smart is because everything can be connected to the internet, everything communicates real time. And the, of course, because of the vast capacity of devices you can connect, anything can be censored and every, anything can be used real time to apply something. Let's say if you have um, uh, humidity at one of your buildings, you can sense it, you can do something about it. If you have a leakage of uh, gas, everything becomes monitored and censored, and censored in real time. So um, 
Of course, I, I was just wanted to show an experience um, because we talked before with your um, um, about the applications that can be used. This is uh, the uh, German uh, Fußballliga. They have an application that, of course, um, they have the they have won the award. Uh, it's it's a it's a joint um, um, it's a joint uh, activity between Vodafone, um, the German Fußballliga, and, and a university. To be honest. And what they did, they have an application where you can use it while you're at the field. And you can see, I mean, this application gives you real-time information and you can see while you're at the stadium, you can see the, um, the football player that's running, the kilometers he's running, um, what's his name, and where is he located, how the pass will be uh, further on, and stuff like that. So um, it means there's so many applications you can create using 5G, which is it's amazing what can, you can do. Um, I just wanted to mention also, because you're going to talk about smart city, of course, it's smart tourists where you can have applications on the mobile phones of the tourists and they can see information about the, um, the uh, exhibitions and museums and, you know, in, in Cyprus, everything is outside. So 5G is a requirement to have this, this, this virtual experience. And yeah, I mean, you can see this is a real application that's now uh, been launched in, 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 in the British Museum that you can, you can use the application and you get information about all the exhibitions. And of course, they also have holograms and you can um, see um, using the hologram an actual implementation of what went on, like in dinosaurs. And, 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 and this is, I think, it's a story about the um, uh, white uh, whale. Um, so, of course, uh, the health is another industry. We talked about um, remote um, uh, applications that for, for surgery. I mean, we have a lot of doctors that are very specialized in certain um, surgeries and they cannot be anywhere in the world. They can use uh, 5G because of this uh, low latency and the real-time application to, to do surgery from around the world. And of course, in, in industries and in, in UK, we have, uh, I just wanted to mention that almost all of the uh, 5G applications are, um, are either sponsored by the government or using um, public and uh, private uh, funding and universities to launch all these applications. So in, in, in UK, we have the first full-blown 5G factory. It's a boiler factory. So we have um, um, analogous factories in Cyprus, which is a small industry if you think about it. So um, the, the owners of the factory, they talked about uh, how they can, um, how it was very difficult for them to, because of it's a small factory, to apply uh, various technologies and because of 5G and all these sensors that they can put inside the factory, they can um, have a, a, a huge efficiency and their productivity has increased by 2%. And of course, they don't have that many uh, mistakes in their production line. Um, um the uh, it's very important about the um the running of the ports so in cyprus we have ports so we can uh, introduce applications i have a video clip i don't know if i have time to show it but i mean in in in, uh, in italy we have two ports of course in hong kong and other uh, chinese uh, ports that are full uh, 5g operated and no human is, is associated everything that comes in is censored it has a number a device and everything is run um using remote um, uh, equipment. Of course, agriculture, we have a lot of applications of, um, for the, for the um, livestock and of course for the environment and the uh, censoring of the fields and, um, uh, and, and making sure that everything is run smoothly. Energy, energy is big, it's big on 5G and of course smart city, which my, my colleague is going to talk about right now. Can again? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Anu. Uh, before uh, Mr. Franguli starts, I, I think she's uh, finished. Are you finished, Mrs. Yano? Yes. But now uh, maybe there is <clears throat> uh, one or two questions from uh, from the audience. Anybody wishes to? Uh, I just, I just want to say that what I, what I wanted to uh, convey is that 5G is here, it's in Cyprus, which is a big thing for us, and we have to make sure that it's been used. So we have to um, create the opportunities for the usage of 5G, either to B2B or in the, um, in, the, um, um, in, in the public or the private sector, 
but it's um I mean, you, you have to have these um, these initiatives to have to use it and, and 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 make sure that you get the benefits out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very impressed about the, the data and the facts. Um, of course, the type and the series of applications that 5G uh, supports uh, is quite known to us as universities, as academic institutions. Actually, <clears throat> we had um, some talks yesterday about the use of uh, digital twins or um, in another perspective, yes. VR related um, for hospital management, for uh, electronic patient records and so on. Today, we are going to have uh, Professor Mihailidis um, talking about uh, uh, sea traffic management and the project they have with uh, ports. So I I'm sure that they are going to uh, investigate 5G as an alternative to their data uh, supporting mechanism. Um, do you know if the government uh, has any intention to support financially any initiatives like in the UK? Uh, we, we had a talk with Geve uh, about a month ago and they're initiating something with the government. So I can, as when they send the information, I can convey them to you. We can share it. Excellent, perfect. Uh, okay, and the last question. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about the implications or the consequences on public health for 5G, I mean. Um, do you have something to reassure people that uh, 5G is secure in terms of uh, health implications? Do you have any study? Because people are usually afraid, rumors uh, going here, there in, in Facebook, on social networks. There is a lot of fuss, a lot of talk how do you respond to this, uh, let's say, okay. we, we have Yes, we have launched a website where we have all this uh, data you're, you're, um, as you're requesting. And um, actually, I just, that's why I started the presentation showing that 5G is just a, an extension of the 2G. So the, net, the mobile networks were out there. It's been now how many? 40 years. So 5G is just the continuation of the previous network. It's nothing more, nothing different. It's just a continuation. It's just more effective as a network than the previous ones. Um, but we have the data. I can share the link um, to, yeah. so you can read anything you want. And yeah. we, as soon as we have data, usually we, because we're a partner of Vodafone, we have data from around the world and we post them on the site so that people understand that this is not, you know, this is not a black magic or whatever. This is just an extension of the existing network. It, 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 it runs on the same frequencies. So, so there's nothing different. Mm, it's okay. just a more, it's a better network. That's it. Yeah, yeah I know. Okay, if you could please um, add yeah. this link in your presentation before sending it, it would be excellent. Okay, so okay. thank you very much again. Uh, so we can proceed with uh, Mr. Fragulis. Yeah, the floor is yours. You can share uh, your screen the same way as Mrs. Ioannou. Just press the green button at the lower part of the screen. Yes. And choose the window. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. OK. OK, good morning from me as well. Thank you, Nikki, for the introduction. So what I'm going to share with you, it's uh, some basic principles regarding Smart City and uh, what uh, we have done with uh, uh, Nicosia uh, project. So uh, a small definition of a Smart City. Uh, a Smart City uses information and communication technology to improve operational efficiency, share information with the public and provide a better quality of government service and citizen welfare. So what is uh, the basic idea of a smart city? As uh, Nikki mentioned before, it's, uh, we use uh, various sensors uh, to gather data uh, and each sensor has uh, its uh, smart application. So we have in the middle uh, of, the, of the system, we have the smart city platform, which uh, resides on a cloud data center. 
And then we have various uh, smart uh, sensors, uh, depending each municipality, uh, which strategy or what uh, decides uh, to have uh, to control. So for example, we have here a smart water metering. We install this uh, smart uh, sensor uh, on premise of the uh, consumer of the citizen. Uh, we gather information from this uh, sensor to the smart application and then uh, through the smart city platform uh, functionalities uh, we we read the data and then we react for example if we have a leakage if we have a big consumption so we have a reaction that's why we receive and uh, read the data so we have a lot of uh, here uh, um, sensors that uh, are in use. Uh, we have waste management, we have smart parking, we can have environmental sensors, we have smart lighting. So all these kinds of sensors uh, are gathered and then by the end of the day, we present this uh, uh, process data to the um, uh, direct to the citizens uh, through a mobile app or uh, web pages or through info points. So uh, what we have here, I'm trying to explain that we have a, in a high uh, level, we have a five layers uh, regarding a smart city. At the bottom, we have the device uh, layer where we have the sensors, sorry. Then uh, where the sensors uh, here, they read the various, uh, uh, measurements that we need to to measure and uh, then we have the connectivity layer here is the technology we use to to transfer the data from the sensor to the uh, application uh, the two major uh, technologies that we have here is the it's the traditional one it is the LoRa one it is uh, a uh, private network uh, it is used now because uh, um, the smart city projects are now uh, getting uh, uh, are booming. So uh, before it, we have uh, small areas, that's why they, they used to use the LoRa one uh, networks. But nowadays, narrow ban IoT, it's a matching technology. It's based on the uh, network of mobile telephony. So this is a new technology that uh, now it is used. And I have to mention here that each technology has its own sensor. So depending on the technology, we choose the appropriate sensor in order to read and transfer the data. Then we have the next layer is a data collection layer where we have the applications as uh, I mentioned before. And then we have above of these, we have the integration layer. It's a smart city platform, that one. It, it is an umbrella platform that uh, uh, hosts all these applications and uh, it takes all the data from these uh, applications. Uh, it uh, integrates this data, correlates this data, and by the end of the day, uh, it presents them uh, through dashboards or mobile applications or web applications. Uh, to the citizens and also to the people the, uh, of the municipality in order to take actions. Here we have a high level architecture of, a, of one uh, smart city platform. So what we have here uh, at the, this layer is, we call it the, the southbound layer and above we have the northbound layer. So, uh, and uh, smart platform, uh, smart platform uh, application uh, gathers, and uh, it's an open, uh, you know, it's an open uh, system of, uh, platform. It gathers information from any available uh, uh, sensor or technology, uh, or through cameras. It depends uh, what you want to to see and uh, read. Then these data are uh, through a gateway are uh, transferred to the, to the platform and the platform has a lot of uh, functionality. Uh, it, it, it can control from the platform, uh, somebody can control all the sensors, switch on, switch off the sensors. 
uh, change uh, thresholds. Uh, you can have many tenants or many customers. Uh, you can give authorization security uh, to people that uh, see data, read data. Uh, we can have video streaming in the platform. So from cameras, we can have videos and see what's happening on the road. We can put uh, uh, various rules, uh, there is rule engines for, to put some rules or some procedures or workflows. Also, we can define alerts, uh, incidents, how we manage incidents. And uh, all these uh, uh, functionalities uh, take the data and they correlate and they integrate this data. And we have, uh, as I mentioned, the presentation layer where these data are presented, are correlated uh, to, uh, to maps or to mobile apps, uh, depending uh, on the on the usage we want to have. Also, we have um, these platforms. Usually, they have APIs that uh, they give access uh, to the data, and, uh, and these APIs uh, are given to or to universities or to other uh, uh, mobile app vendors in order to make. Um, uh, news uh, to have statistics uh, to create a new apps new whatever they the municipality wants to have as a a new feature for uh, for its uh, uh, people that uh, live in this uh, municipality so what we have done in Nicosia, Nicosia, we have here, uh, we, we have a Nokia platform. We, I have to say that we, I see that we have, uh, we gain the, the, um, the, the tender and uh, we are now in the process that we are going to build this uh, uh, platform and all these applications for the Nicosia municipality. So we have a vertical solutions on the uh, south pond, as I mentioned before. We have uh, environmental monitoring. We will have in Nicosia with six sensors. We can have a smart waste management with 140 sensors. We will control lights in the city with 400 uh, light controller sensors. And also we'll... Uh, uh, utilize uh, 250 parking sensors for smart parking. Also, uh, Negocia will install digital cameras uh, in order to control uh, uh, the very roads and during the night, uh, all these things. Uh, so we'll have a video monitoring system with video analytics. And also they ask, and it's a part of the project to have a traffic uh, monitoring model using drones and also a, a software model that all these uh, data will be integrated uh, to the Nokia platform. And uh, this information uh, will be presented, presented to dashboards and mobile apps. So this is uh, how we'll uh, design, in few words, the Nicosia Smart City. And also they ask to have uh, 10 info points in various uh, parts of the city for the citizens. So by the end of the day, these are some uh, pictures of the, of the maps here of the Nicosia. Here the, uh, at real time, uh, they will have a uh, knowledge of what uh, happening to the various sensors. They can switch on, switch off. Uh, they will take actions. Here they have various statistics. Uh, they have uh, environmental uh, information. All these things are in uh, presented on, uh, as I mentioned, to uh, dashboards. And also we will uh, install to them a, a control center with video walls in order to to see the whole uh, map of the Nicosia. 
So uh, our solution, as I mentioned before, uh, it builds around Nokia's uh, integrated operation set uh, platform. This platform, it's a hybrid platform. It means that can integrate both uh, narrow band IoT, as I mentioned, it's a new emerging technology and the LoRa one sensors. We have uh, the vertical applications I mentioned before, different uh, vendors. This is, uh, we have to say that one, we have to underline this, that uh, we can have from various vendors uh, data so the platform can integrate the data from many vendors and uh, one uh, other thing i have to mention is that all systems it's a strategic decision from sida that uh, we host local all the applications uh, and the smart city platform in our data center which are certified with uh, iso 27001 and uh, tier 3 compatible and uh, the solution we are going to build, it's a multi-tenant and can be easily expanded. So we can uh, accommodate or we can host uh, many uh, municipalities uh, in our data center. Here, um, I try to make a comparison between the two technologies because we are talking about the, the 5G, uh, uh, topic is that, uh, as I mentioned be before, narrow band IoT technology is uh, the new uh, matching technology. LoRa One, it's the established technology. It's for more dense areas. Uh, but since the smart city projects are getting uh, much, um, I mean, there are much more cities are now thinking to have. Uh, uh, smart uh, city uh, applications, uh, narrow band IoT is the most, the, most, the most appropriate technology. So we are using the mobile telephone network. We have wide coverage, it's very strong signal. There's a data security, it's maintenance free. As I mentioned before, it's a rising technology and somebody has to pay monthly charges like uh, uh, it's a mobile, like the normal mobile phone. Uh, LoRa One, it's a private network which uses free frequencies. It's appropriate in these areas. As I mentioned, it was more established technology smart city project, but since the areas are getting much more uh, greater, uh, we're going to the narrow band IoT technology. So uh, we have to build a private network here and it's a low level security and more vulnerable intrusions. So, uh, I try to cover all the basic issues regarding the smart city. And if you have any questions, uh, happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Frangulis. Um, we are a bit uh, uh, late. So uh, if there is any question to address to Mr. Frangulis, I can, we can take a couple of questions. I think it was a very um, interesting presentation, um, emphasizing the potential of such uh, smart city platforms, not only for Nicosia, of course, but for every other city in Limassol and all other similar service uh, providers. So uh, <clears throat> if there is any question. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes, Andreas. Yeah, okay. Um, as, as I know, in, in order to get benefit from a 5G telephone device... Can you, can you please uh, switch on your camera just to... Ah, okay. Yes. Thank you. Can you see me? Okay. Yes. Uh, Mr. Pandelis and Mrs. Nigi, uh, as I know, in order to benefit from the 5G network and uh, benefit from a 5G enabled device, a mobile device, this device has to be certified by SIDA. Um, so let's say that you want to use in, in the context of a project to use some um, sensors, 5G sensors to make, um, to establish a, a network or to benefit from the 5G speeds and so on. I, I don't understand how this device 
uh, can be used or utilized. Uh, they are going to need to be certified the, on the same way and the same rationale as uh, mobile phones. Can you please uh, explain this? Uh, for Negi, uh, I will ask. I will ask her regarding this the smart city project. Uh, regarding smart city project, uh, we need the narrowband IoT. Narrowband IoT technology can be served with the 4.5 and the 5G. So what we have here, and we are doing some pilot projects. We are using the existing uh, network connectivity. And we are doing some pilot project with the water ports and uh, uh, in Nicosia, and now we're going to have with uh, um, Limassol, I believe. So we are using the existing technology. So regarding the mobile phones, this uh, Nigi should, uh, Nigi, you are, can ask the, with us. So regarding Mar City, we are using the established uh, the existing uh, network connectivity technology. I have the impression that Nikki is not uh, with us. Maybe she she locked out. <clears throat> but if I understand the, the question correctly, so uh, if someone buys, for example, uh, some sensors from, I don't know where, uh china or well should should we bring it to sida for certification if sida that does not certify the equipment we, we cannot use it uh, on the 5g network i i believe that was the question uh Okay, uh, we have to write down the question. We'll answer it because we have the to have the right. Okay. Person. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other question? Okay, um, Mr. Frankulis, please uh, stop sharing your screen because we have to switch between speakers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation, and looking forward to. Uh, continuing our discussion uh, later on these uh, very interesting topics. Thank All you. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, according to the program, the next uh, presentation is uh, about the Data Cloud uh, Horizon 2020 project and will be delivered by Professor Andrea Marella from the Sapienza Universidad di Roma. Di Roma. Uh, Professor Marella. Good is morning. Uh, can you hear me? Here and we can uh, see you as well. Thank you for being here. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the Zoom? Can you share? Yeah, 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 yeah. We do teaching uh, every day with Zoom. So. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, you should be able now to see the presentation. Yes, perfect. It's okay. Okay, so uh, I'm doing today a short presentation about uh, the uh, Horizon 2020 Data Cloud uh, project. So first of all, uh, my name is Andrea Marrella. I am an assistant professor at Sapienza University of Rome. I'm here today because I am the unit leader uh, for, for the side of Sapienza of this project. Uh, Data Cloud is uh, a recently funded uh, a European project under the program Horizon 2020. Uh, it has started basically very uh, on 1st January to 2021, so we are at the very beginning of the project. Uh, the target, uh, the main target of the project uh, is the development of, uh, a, let's say, an innovative software ecosystem for, uh, uh, let's say, efficiently and uh, uh, for an efficient and an effective management of the big data pipeline encompassing the computing continuum. So first of all, what is, the, what is a data pipeline and what is computing continuum? So a data pipeline, in reality, we are already, we are still studying, uh, uh, let's say, um, a common ag and agreed definition of what is a data pipeline, because uh, uh, there are several definitions in the literature. 
but we can in some way abstract it uh, as a set of action that are able to digest uh, a huge amount of, of raw data that come from heterogeneous sources. Uh, and uh, their target is to move this data uh, to a certain destination uh, in order to store them, processing them and analyze them with the target to find, let's say, uh, insights from this data. What is the computing continuum? The computing, compu computing continuum is a concept that extends the traditional centralized cloud computing, uh, and in particular extends the cloud computing concept using uh, the uh, other two concepts that are the fog computing and the edge computing, whose target at the end is to, let's say, move part of the computation close to the data sources. This uh, in order to, let's say, make uh, the, uh, any computation that is done in the cloud uh, uh, more efficient. This uh, picture basically shows, uh, the, uh, uh, shows the life cycle of, uh, the, of, a, of a data pipeline that starts from its definition, its simulation, its provisioning, its deployment, and uh, its adaptation. In reality, before defining the data pipeline, there is uh, an important phase that I will try to, uh, let's say, I will try to make a focus on this, that is called discovery. That is about uh, the first part of discovery this data pipeline from the uh, uh, data sources. About the uh, consortium, the consortium of this project consists of 11 partners from eight countries. It is led by one research institute, that is this uh, CINTEF. And uh, uh, there are three university partners. We, as Sapiens, are one of these university partners, of course. And uh, the, um, uh, there are six uh, a small, medium enterprise and one large company that act as uh, both as technology, uh, te technology providers and stakeholder for the project. Uh, why we think that data cloud is uh, uh, timely? So uh, the fact is that we are uh, in a, you know, because you are doing smart cities at the end. So we, we start from the same assumption that uh, we are in, a, in, a, in an era, let's say, where we have uh, a recent, where a, a strong development of uh, Internet of Things and cloud-based technologies. And with these developments, uh, there, is, there are also massive amount of data that are generated by heterogeneous sources and uh, that are stored into our dedicated cloud solution. So with this, uh, with this in mind, uh, we can uh, data cloud, uh, let's say, identify, identifies the following issues that, uh, let's say, are by the way, quite, quite uh, uh, that can be agreed, let's say. Uh, first of all, the organization tend to uh, generate uh, much more data than they are able to interpret. Secondly, uh, these data are saved uh, into the cloud. So all organizations are inclined to save everything. So to don't waste everything and save everything into the cloud. But the, the, the fact is that the current cloud technologies, cloud, the current cloud computing technologies uh, are not able to fully meet the requirement uh, uh, of the various big data processing application and their data transfer. Starting from this issue, uh, the problem is that uh, the majority of this data uh, usually are stored just for compliant purposes. And the majority of these data are not concretely turned into value. This kind of data now are called, can be called as dark data. Dark data represents a kind of an untapped value for an organization that, uh, uh, for which the organization does not know if there is or not some business value behind this dark data. And uh, in the other hand, this dark data also pose some risk for the organization themselves. Dark data is one of the, we can say, is one of the buzzword of these last two years, okay? What are dark data? According to Gartner, that, you know, Gartner is the global, uh, uh, the global leaders in IT research and advisory services. So dark data uh, are defined as uh, the information that the organization are able to collect process and store during the traditional business activities that are performed in the organization, but generally fail to use for other purposes. So are these data that are collected, but not concretely used for generating business value. 
There is a recent international data corporation study. So here, uh, sorry, but I missed to put the reference, but you can find very easily on Google. Uh, roughly the 90% of organization data can be considered as dark. This because we come back to the, our initial assumption that with the IoT and with the availability of the cloud technologies, we produce a lot of data and we store a lot of data more than more than needed, okay? So the, while many organization, some organization may never use some dark data, we cannot ignore their presence. And there are several reasons for that. The two main reasons are, one is a security reason, because storing excessive dark data into the cloud make it hard to secure sensitive information. I make here just a very simple example. Suppose that we are in the, in the cloud, uh, all the files that we have recorded over the time. And uh, uh, let's say after year, these files may not seem relevant for an organization. So we can uh, consider uh, all documents with the customer's payment information, a draft related to our internal project and so on. Uh, why this data are not, inter are not, they are not of interest for the organization They can be of interest, for example, for an organization insider, for a competitor, or for an external attacker that can try to exploit this data for uh, several gain, monetary gain, political gain, to sell them to a competitor and so on. So this, uh, kind, of, uh, a, this kind of aspect is uh, not uncommon today. So on the one hand, we, we, we need to put uh, uh, let's say we cannot uh, neglect the existence of this dark data. So first for a security reason, and second because uh, uh, behind dark data there are economic opportunity for organization. And uh, this is a trend of these last years. So the idea to try to exploit the uh, knowledge behind dark data in order to uh, take advantage of uh, these values and uh, drive new revenues or reduce internal cost of the, for the organization itself. Here, just, for, just as an example, we can see some uh, kind of data that often are left dark. And we can think to, for example, to server log files uh, that uh, usually can give uh, a insight, uh, insights related to the enactment of the workflows of an organization or the previous employee data, financial statement, geolocalization data, uh, customer call records. Uh, for example, customer call records are a kind of dark data that uh, usually can hold uh, valuable information about the customer too, but we have recorded in, in the cloud and we don't consider them so much. There are also files that can no longer be accessed because uh, they were used by devices that uh, now are obsolete, for example. So we can find a lot of examples of data that are potentially dark. So how bringing this dark data into the light? So we, as a consortium, we have envisioned two major steps, two abstract steps to be followed. The first one is, uh, of course, try to capture and define in some way this dark data doing that without, without manipulating the systems and network of an organization. So the idea is that we, we need to detect and define this dark data in some way so to understand at least that they exist without, uh, let's say, changing the existing technologies and network that are in place in, in an organization, okay? On the other hand, once an organization has an understanding of what dark data exists. And uh, as I said before, the majority of data that are in the cloud are dark according to these uh, recent reports. The idea of the project is to try to push this dark data in a, into a big data platform to process and analyze them. This uh, to, first of all, to unlock their meaning, their semantics, and secondly, to extract insight from them. Not from all of them, of course, but uh, let's say to understand what their data can be useful and what their data are useless, we need first to process and analyze them. And then from some of them, potentially, finally, we can uh, derive some business value. These two abstract steps uh, are the ones that have, drove the, have uh, driven the, uh, um, 
realization of the uh, data cloud proposal. And uh, one of the key aspects of data cloud is to focus on a big data pipeline in order to, let's say, identify dark data. So we, we analyze big data pipeline because we think that analyzing what happened in the big data pipeline, we can reconstruct the procedure that manipulate the data and uh, let's say read the data inside an organization. And so also identify dark data. Of course, uh, working with big data potential, with big data pipelines requires uh, to go beyond the current approaches and framework for big data processing. And there is a lot of literature uh, that talk of that. So why the computing continuum? Because uh, uh, in order to, uh, let's say, uh, push the big data processing to its uh, boundaries, let's say, uh, uh, we want to move from the centralized cloud data centers uh, to the entire computing continuum too. So exploiting the edge and fog uh, computing uh, uh, concepts. This on the one hand to support the efficient processing of this big data pipeline and uh, to eventually, let's say, put this dark data to the light, okay? So this is the, let's say, the story that uh, uh, is behind this data cloud uh, project. According to, uh, let's say, the, the, this uh, picture shows the, uh, the conceptual architecture of the project, consider that we are very, at the very beginning of the project. So let's say the, uh, all the concepts are still uh, at, the, at the preliminary stage. The idea is to uh, develop this uh, uh, toolbox consisting of uh, uh, six main uh, tools. And any tool uh, is able to cover uh, one uh, specific step of the big data pipeline lifecycle. So very quickly, there is a first step that is called pipeline discovery that uh, enable to analyze uh, the, uh, the data pre present in the databases of the company, in the data stores of the company, and uh, try to discover big data pipelines from uh, these sources. The uh, idea, so we envision to use process mining techniques for doing, for performing this step. Then there is uh, a def pipe uh, step that uh, is focused on specifying the feature of the pipeline at, uh, a, let's say, a good abstraction level uh, that is good for data processing. SimPipe is about the simulation of the uh, identified and defined data pipeline. This uh, to, uh, let's say, evaluate at the same time before uh, deploying this data pipeline. So at the same time, we can evaluate the performance of the individual step of the pipeline, of, of the pipeline themselves. Fourth step is the resource provisioning that is concerned about uh, the uh, a secure, a safe provisioning of uh, uh, resources for uh, processing data pipeline. Pipeline deployment. So trivially, this is about the deployment of the pipeline on top of the resources uh, uh, provisioned in the previous step. And finally, the pipeline adaptation. So the idea is that try to optimize this, that, this big data pipeline at runtime, but this optimization, this optimization is performed by adapting the provisioning of the computational resources available into, let's say, into the, uh, into the project. Uh, behind this architecture, there are, of course, several uh, research uh, challenges. Um, so there are challenges related to the process mining techniques uh, that we will use to learn the structure of data pipeline. So for pipeline discovery, the definition of proper uh, um, description languages for uh, defining pipelines. Uh, where the, one of the organization is uh, investigating novel approaches for uh, a, a good pipeline cont containerization. Uh, there is uh, the development of a resource marketplace based on blockchain to enable a secure transferring of this data pipeline. So there are several research challenges that are behind the project. And any of the partner that we saw before is uh, focused on one of these research challenges. The overall expected impact of this project is to try to lower the technological entry barrier 
for incorporating uh, big data pipelines into the organization workflows. This uh, regardless of the hardware infrastructure. So the, our idea is to develop this uh, toolbox, this ecosystem that can be used uh, regardless of the hardware infrastructure uh, by, let's say, uh, different organizations uh, that come from different application domains. And in fact, uh, for validating our uh, hypothesis, uh, we have, uh, let's say, a good group of business cases. Uh, in particular, we have four uh, small, medium enterprises and one large companies that, uh, uh, for which we want to validate our uh, toolbox. And uh, these companies are, uh, come from very different domains because there is a company that uh, is uh, focused on uh, um, uh, market, on investigating uh, marketing, marketing campaigns. Uh, there is another company that uh, is focused on, re on uh, um, uh, realizing reduced live, reduced live streaming production for sport events. There is a, a company that comes from the care domain and that is developing a um, cloud-based tool for passion data management. And we have also two companies that come from the manufacturing domain. Uh, one of them, the large company is Bosch. I think I can also disclose a little bit that. And uh, the, their idea is to, uh, um, let's say, reduce using this data pipeline to reduce the time to production and perform a better analytics uh, in industry.40 manufacturing. So if you need more information uh, about that, uh, you can, of course, uh, check the web uh, page. OK, so this is the overview of the project. I don't know if I have more time or not, uh, because if I have more time, I can say something about one component. Otherwise, we can close here. You, you have uh, two or three minutes more. Okay. If you so, like to elaborate. Very, very quickly, very quickly, just to, uh, let's say, uh, have a focus on one of these components. We are Sapienza, are, let's say, are focused on realizing the uh, first uh, uh, tool of the uh, ecosystem that is called this pipe. This pipe is about the discovery of uh, big data pipelines. So the idea is that uh, we try to analyze uh, uh, historical data and uh, stream data from the data sources. And we try to find, uh, let's say, a, a kind of a structure of this big data pipeline. Um, I try to go very quickly. Um, we are three, there are three major steps uh, that are performed by this uh, first uh, tool, this pipe. First of all, the extraction of data from the data sources, then the discovery of pipeline, and finally, the uh, derivation of analytics that can be, let's say, that are uh, uh, in some way hidden inside the discovery, the behind the discovery data pipeline. Uh, the, first, I have shown you the uh, conceptual architecture. This is the same architecture, but with the uh, tools, the separate tools that are emphasized. This, uh, uh, this pipe, so this, this discovery tool is the first uh, tool of the, uh, of the uh, architecture. So it's the one that concretely interacts with the real data. This is the architecture that is the envisioned architecture, of course. As I said, you, we are at the very beginning. This is the envisioned architecture of the, of the tool, uh, uh, whose target is to first extract uh, the uh, data from the data sources, then to perform some uh, uh, to perform some uh, uh, activities to transform this raw data coming from heterogeneous sources into event data. So our idea is to extract the event that are behind this data. Of course, the event related to the data pipeline. And for doing that, there are several steps that uh, must be done. There are steps concerned concern to the preprocessing of the data, the segmentation of, uh, of the data. Segmentation means that we have uh, this huge uh, data that maybe contain information about several pipelines, and we need to discover uh, uh, for any event uh, that is behind the data uh, to which pipeline it uh, can be matched. So this is a very, this is a, a hot, uh, let's say, challenge in, the, in our domain. Uh, let's say after doing this uh, uh, extraction, our idea is to, per, is to exploit uh, process discovery techniques uh, under the umbrella of process mining to identify the structure of data pipeline. 
In parallel, every data that is discarded from this first step of preprocessing is, uh, uh, let's say, temporarily recorded as dark data. And at a certain point in this third step that is called pipeline and dark data analysis and visualization, we perform two special techniques uh, for which we are doing research at Sapienza that are called compliance checking improvement and replay to replay the found data pipeline and the discarded data to understand if we can, uh, let's say, retrieve some of the discarded data in order to add value to the data pipeline. Okay, so this is the basic idea of uh, what we are doing. So extraction, preprocessing, uh, identification of data pipeline and dark data, and then try to understand which or what of these dark data can be useful to really provide some value to the business, uh, to the data pipeline. So this is the target of our DSPICE pipe component that then is connected to the uh, other tools uh, in the toolbox, uh, one for simulation and the other for definition. As Sapienza, we are focused on this. I Now, I don't show you the uh, specific challenge that we have to table, that there are a lot. If you want, I can leave you the slides. Uh, we, of course, are, are, are uh, putting uh, some existing technologies into the project that are technologies that we are investigating uh, during our research path uh, over the last year. In particular, we have investigating aspect about uh, the usage of process mining in industry 4.0 and the digital twin based process management for industries. And uh, uh, just to conclude, to conclude uh, the uh, objective of uh, this discovery part uh, is, to, uh, is to improve this uh, uh, discovery algorithms in process mining in order to make them 40% faster and more accurate. This metric is calculated on the basis of this benchmark that you can find here. And in particular, uh, let's say this, this, this discovery techniques uh, will be the first technique that concretely uh, don't focus just on, on the activities inside the pipeline, but will focus also on the data that are manipulated and exchanged. And uh, I think that I can close here because I'm out of time. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marella. Um, I have one clarification before I give the, uh, I pass yeah. the question to, to the audience. I, I didn't quite understand, is there any automation uh, in the process uh, of uh, detecting uh, what is that data or not? Yeah, there is automation. How, how is this uh, performed by, by, by a rule-based approach? How, how do you do this uh, differentiation? You, you have said the, the right thing. So one approach is a rule-based. So uh, let's say this, in particular, these two steps that are called compliance checking and replay dark data over pipelines. So we apply here, uh, let's say, some uh, techniques uh, that uh, are called conformal checking techniques uh, that uh, on the one hand, you have the data pipeline, that is uh, some way a flow of, uh, of actions. On the other hand, uh, you compare this data pipeline, uh, you can compare against uh, all rules that can be expressed, for example, in uh, a linear temporal logic, so in some lang temporal language, for example. Um, and for doing that, we, we will also uh, use some artificial intelligence techniques. So we are studying the usage of automated planning. I, know, I don't know if you know automated planning, but automated planning to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, perform this uh, replay. By the way, you need something in input to, to derive this data, of course, okay? Mm -hmm. And this input can be a rule, can be another model, can be, let's say, a, a negative example. So we are investigating several strategies for performing that. Okay. The one with the rules is the one that is already in place in reality. So we have already did research by to identify this dark data using rules. Mm -hmm. and, and who uh, dictates these rules? Experts? Experts, yes, yes. These rules, uh, these rules uh, can come from, uh, come from the interview with the domain expert. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then, that's the idea. Then maybe in, six, in the next six months, I can say, okay, we have, uh, uh, we have succeeded to derive some of these rules automatically. But uh, now, now the idea is to 
so since we are interviewing the, the companies, we are trying to derive these rules uh, uh, through this interaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other question from the audience? Yes, I have, I have one, one question. Yes, Michalis, please. It's a general question. Uh, can, we, can we apply data lakes architecture in order to treat the dark data? Have you investigated something like this? Uh, no, we have not investigated the application of the lake, but I think, yes, it's doable, of course. So yes, yes, it's another strategy. It's another strategy. So uh, let's say this... Uh, uh, for, for this kind of call or, or Horizon 2020, it was uh, it was strongly required to move towards uh, cloud computing. Okay? okay, so that's one of the reasons because we are we are investigating cloud computing. By the way, I think that of course yes, you can uh, you can use that lake. Why not? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Professor Marella, for the very interesting presentation. Thanks for uh, the Thank you very much. We are now moving forward to our next speaker. Um, the next uh, presentation is about uh, the STEAM project, the Sea Traffic Management in the Eastern Mediterranean. And this talk will be delivered by my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Michalis Mikhailidis. Uh, Michali, are you with us? Ah, okay. So, Michalis, uh, you can share now your screen. Yes, uh, let me see how to do this. Lower part, it's a share button, and yeah. then you select the window of your presentation. If you if you have many windows open, just uh, open the presentation uh, to have it in uh, in place, and then you can share your screen. Yes, it's currently not responding. So let me. Yeah, your image is uh, is somehow freezed. So maybe you can uh, log out and log in again. It's just a second. We can hear your voice, but uh, your image is frozen. Michalis, can you hear us? Maybe it's it's me who has a problem. Can anyone confirm that I am? Uh, no, Andre, we cannot hear Michalis. Ah, okay. So it's Michalis' problem. I thought for a moment that it was my problem, so <laughs> thank you, Rodos. Mm -hmm. Let me give him a call. Hi, can you hear me? Ah, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, let me let me see if I can make this work because I'm 
I'm having some issues with uh, freezing problems on my computer. Uh, do you want to send me the presentation <clears throat> and I can share it uh, on my screen? Actually, if, if, you continue, if you continue with, uh, with, with problems uh, sharing your, your presentation, you can send it to me. Okay, just uh, let me see one second. I see a second window trying to share the screen. So maybe you can kill that, that uh, window. I'm not sure what what goes wrong, but yeah, maybe I need to pass this on to Irodotos and yeah, Irodote, can you can you take over, please? Because I don't seem to be able to. Uh, you mean share the presentation or deliver the presentation or deliver my presentation first? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you you can do all of it basically. Um, <laughs> do you do you need my presentation or? Well, yes, see. I would. Uh, just a second. Michalis, if you if you send it to any of us or either all of us uh, or me, I can share it and you can talk. It's not visible right now, my presentation, right? I mean, you yeah. cannot. Yeah, we, we can see a window uh, to trying to, to share the screen. Now, okay, the window now is gone. Can, can you still hear us? Yes. But... Okay, so try now to, before sharing your screen, go to the presentation, just to be the active window when you share your screen. Go to a presentation, okay? Mm -hmm. You went to the presentation, you see your presentation on PowerPoint now? Yeah, right now I see my presentation in full screen, but it doesn't seem to be- No, 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 don't, don't put it in full screen. Put it just in, in a normal uh, view. Then okay. return to Zoom and try to share your screen, choosing the, the presentation that will be available in your windows there. Yes, the problem see that I don't see an option to, oh, here it is. Okay, just a second. Okay, here we go again. Yes, okay. It's doing something. Yes. How about now? Yeah, yeah, you can, uh, you can, put it in full uh, presentation mode and you can start. Are you viewing it correctly now or is it? I, I see what you see, uh, maybe. How about now? Yeah, perfect. We see a, a small window, please move away from. Okay, now it's, it's okay. You can, you can uh, start. If you, if you do not wish to, to turn on your camera, I will try, but just to, because yeah, I think it's okay. it no, Perfect. Perfect. I cannot do anything with the please move the screen, though, is it? And then it's on top of the screen. It does not bother us at all. It's on the, on the logo. Don't, don't okay. bother. Sorry. Just... Sorry about that. Now it's gone. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, uh, Michaelis Michaelidis, it's bug again. I have no idea why. Sorry. Don't bother. Don't bother. It's okay. It's on the title. It's not uh, that much of a problem. All right. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for that. Um, Michaelis Michaelidis, I'm an assistant professor. And uh, thank you, Andrea, for this opportunity during the Destiny uh, School to present the STEAM project. So STEAM is a short name for sea traffic management in the Eastern Mediterranean. And just to give you a few facts about the STEAM project, it's uh, an integrated program. So it's through, it's through the Cyprus Research Foundation. It started on January the 2nd, 2019, and it has a duration of three years. So now we're on the last year of the project. 
and there was a funding amount of 1 million euro. And the main purpose behind the STEAM project was to develop the port of Limassol to become a world-class transshipment and information hub, adapting modern digital technologies brought to the maritime sector, and also to become a driver for shore sea shipping in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And this would be accomplished through enhanced services based on standardized ship and port connectivity. As you see, the port of Limassol has a a very important role to play based on the geographical location in the Eastern Mediterranean area. So the objectives of the project can be summarized in five important pillars. The first to improve the efficiency of the various port operations. The second to optimize the sea traffic navigation and facilitate short sea shipping in the Eastern Mediterranean area. The third, to collect real-time information related to ship movements, related to the environment, and related to also the tracking of cargo. The fourth, to ensure high-quality data, be able to calculate key performance indices, and create some new decision support tools and services for the stakeholders. And the fifth, to be able to develop some effective links and synergies among all the interested stakeholders. The general objective, of course, is the efficient management of the sea traffic in the Eastern Mediterranean, while at the same time ensuring safety and environmental sustainability. To achieve these uh, objectives, we've put together a multidisciplinary uh, consortium uh, consisting of established stakeholders of uh, the quadruple helix, we have uh, research academic institutions, ourselves, the Cyprus University of Technology, and also RISE, which stands for the Research Institutes of Sweden. And we have the, from the public sector, the Cyprus Ports Authority. From the civil organizations, we have the Cyprus Shipping Association, and also we have three SMEs, uh, CSCS, Delevant, and Dodotheo, which specialize in different areas associated with the project. We have also put together an associated stakeholder network that composes of established stakeholders in the Cyprus maritime sector. And this contains the, the private actors that are involved at the port of Limassol currently, uh, the DP World, which has, is responsible for the cruise and the general cargo terminal, Eurogate, who handles the container business, and also PNO Maritime, who handle all the services concerning pilots, tugboats, and linesman operations. We also have the Cyprus Shipping Chamber and Marinem as part of this associated stakeholder network. Moreover, we put together an advisory group consisting of established stakeholders of the international maritime sector. And these are some of the names that you can see on your screen from different ports, from the Swedish Maritime Administration, from the Israel Ports Association, and uh, that are very important to be able to further promote the results of the projects to the international uh, maritime sector. Now, the idea of this project came after the Sea Traffic Management Validation Project which was a large uh, European project, probably one of the largest ones uh, in the area of sea traffic management. It had the budget of 43 million euros, over 50 partners, and it ran from 2015 to 2018. Uh, we were involved in this project through the port of Limassol, which participated as one of the nine ports of Europe uh, where the results of the project were validated. And this meant uh, applying the port collaborative decision-making platform, which is a platform that provides a standardized exchange of real-time information in the form of timestamps uh, between all the related actors. And this was implemented and validated in the port of Limassol through the, the STM validation project. Moreover, we had uh, another action of the project that dealt with voyage management services. And this provided support to ships 
uh, both through the planning process and also during the voyage. Now, going back to STEAM, these are the five pillars, the five scientific and technological objectives of the project. And now I'm going to show how this relates to what we're doing. So to improve the efficiency of the various port operations and services, we are extending the port CDM, the platform that I talked about before, uh, to include uh, also other ports of Limassol and also to have some advanced uh, more information basically from the more connectors to existing systems to optimize the sea traffic navigation and short sea shipping we're establishing what we call the Limassol shore center which I'm gonna talk about in the sequence for the third one to collect real-time information we're incorporating some innovative technological solutions and this involves both technologies for collecting AIS information from the ships, also environmental information uh, related to air and water pollution, and also related to cargo tracking information. For the fourth one, we are uh, developing some advanced data analytics services to give to the maritime stakeholder and to develop the, for the fifth one, we are organizing what we call living labs that are some meetings with all the relevant stakeholders that take place uh, every few months. And with respect to how it all comes together, this is the general uh, framework of the technical work packages. And uh, I'm gonna briefly now discuss each of these uh, with respect to what is involved and uh, how, what we expect to achieve, basically. Starting from work package three that deals with uh, port collaborative decision making, the aim here is to extend this platform, this port CDM, uh, to all the, the ports of Cyprus and also uh, be able to provide some new uh, web interfaces and some more mobile applications in order to further develop this platform so it meets uh, um, it meets all the requirements uh, by the local stakeholders and the main idea here is to be able to provide in real time uh, information to all the involved stakeholders relating the process of uh, a ship arrival and departure uh, from the port of Cyprus. So this is gonna be uh, improve the information awareness. And uh, so each actor will be able to convey in real time uh, using timestamps, both the actual what is happening, but also his intentions in, in terms of estimated times. So all this information uh, can really improve the, the scenery with respect to, it can optimize the operations and also it can improve the efficiency. With respect to the second technical work package that deals with the Limassol Shore Center, this will act as a communication hub for the whole Eastern Mediterranean region. And the idea is to be able to provide various services to ships in order to optimize uh, sea traffic navigation in the area and also increase safety and promote and facilitate uh, short sea shipping operations. And this involves uh, some services like uh, cross-check of the, of the route or flow management or enhanced monitoring or some search and rescue operations. As far as new technologies go for the maritime sector, the main idea here is to bring in as much data as we can uh, coming from AIS information. And this is the automatic information that is being transmitted by ships uh, through uh, radio communications, through UHF, uh, but also collect additional information from various devices like buoys or UAVs that are installed at the port 
uh, with the purpose to collect all this information related to ship movements, to the environment and the tracking of cargo. So there are three distinct tasks in this work package. The first deals with AIS data collection and integration. The second with environmental data and the third with the uh, tracking of cargo data. Work package six deals with advanced uh, data analytics. And uh, in this work package, the idea is to be able to integrate all this available data and use some new methods, some new tools to be able to make sense out of the, the data and combine it in intelligent ways in order to extract meaningful insights. And I think the work in this uh, work package more heavily relates to what happens uh, in, the, in the destiny uh, school, in the destiny project. And the, the ideas here is to be able to integrate all this data. So we have port call data, we have AIS data, we have environmental data. The idea is to be able to collect and integrate this into a common storage uh, platform and then apply some advanced techniques like data mining and data analytics to provide enhanced decision support and new services to the stakeholders. So again, this is a, a place where the smart data processing and the systems of deep insight uh, that Andreas uh, has uh, mentioned at the beginning, I think this uh, plays a big role to what we're trying to achieve here. And finally, the work package seven that has to do with the living labs. Uh, here, the idea is to be able to engage all the maritime stakeholders in both formulating the requirements, but also evaluating the results of the project. So we have a number of uh, living labs which are face-to-face -face meetings with all the important stakeholders in order to discuss and in order to evaluate the, the project uh, results. As far as impact uh, of what we're trying to achieve, this revolves around the efficiency, safety, and the environment. And here you can see some key uh, words regarding each of these uh, ideas, each of these pillars. So with respect to efficiency, we are going to reduce the administrative burden. We're going to have better utilization of the port resources. Uh, so we're going to have more efficient operations. Uh, with respect to safety, by providing information to ships in the area, we will improve the, the situational awareness and we will avoid accidents and other unwanted situations. And with respect to environment, there's a number of things here. We are going to provide real-time monitoring against uh, spillage and other uh, pollution that's going to happen by using the, the buoys and the dedicated sensors that we'll have for this purpose, uh, but also by providing information to ships, they can effectively reduce their speed while coming to the port and arrive just in time. And this way we'll, be, uh, we'll have uh, reduced uh, emissions and uh, we will be uh, protecting the environment in this way. We'll be uh, contributing towards uh, reducing the, the pollution in the environment by having just-in-time arrivals to the port. There are also various political, social, and economic impacts, and I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I mean, of course, all the new technologies, all the services, we can have new jobs, and this, uh, in general, is uh, contribute towards the blue economy and towards sustainable operations. And there is a lasting impact on all participating organizations in the project as well. Uh, so to summarize, what is the STEAM project? The STEAM project uh, has the goal of upgrading the maritime significance of Cyprus. And to do this, we will do it uh, through five distinct uh, pillars. Uh, the first one is to improve the efficiency of the port operations by working on port CDM, by extending port CDM. 
The second is by the Limassol Shore Center and the services in the area. We wish to optimize the sea traffic and navigation and facilitate shore sea shipping in the area. The third is to be able to collect real time information related to ship movements, the environment and the tracking of cargo. And for the fourth one to combine this information to appropriately fuse this information in order to calculate uh, KPIs and new decision support tools and services. And the fifth is to develop these effective links and synergies. This lasting uh, synergies are all, all the interested maritime stakeholders. And with respect to, to specifics, Irodotos in the, is going to tell you a lot more about the actual systems and about the data-driven applications that we have in mind that we're developing. And of course, anybody who's interested in participating is more than welcome to, to contact us. How am I on time? Yes, you are, uh, you, you are on time. We are, we are late <laughs> you are on time. But um, yeah, so let me first of all, thank you uh, very much for this uh, uh, interesting presentation and indeed uh, it um, proves the link, the direct link with uh, our project. Um, I can, uh, if I am allowed to say, it's something like a case study of our project. Uh, and I'm very happy to see uh, nearly every pillar of your project uh, having a place in, in our uh, project. Uh, so, um, a, a, a small question, uh, Michalis, uh, you said that you are in the last year of the project, right? Yes. Uh, do you have any plans to uh, submit for something bigger, something uh, in Europe-wise? Uh, uh, what, what are your plans as a consortium to pursue further funding or exploit further the, uh, I'm, I'm sure, very interesting results you got so far? Yeah, of course, we're looking for any other opportunities to, to extend this uh, work. Uh, there was one horizon call that we participated that has to do with uh, smart ports, uh, mostly in energy considerations, so sustainable uh, smart ports. So we, we applied for that. And, but of course, we're looking for any other opportunities to, to continue this research. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any, any question from the audience? Anything anybody wishes to address to our speaker? I, I assume the 5G connectivity or potential will be covered by Irodotos later on, so. Uh, I can, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, five, 5G is a good possibility always, I mean, but uh, the thing is that you have to, to pay for it. So we're using a variety of different communication uh, ways to communicate the, the data we're collecting. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we will be using, we're actually using Wi-Fi right now, uh, but also 3G, 4G connectivity. Uh, we also have a, a router installed at the port that was provided by CETA. Uh, mm -hmm. for this purpose, but also we're using LoRa uh, for the buoys because there we need to we have some longer distances to cover. And I mean, 5G is always a good option, but I mean, it's a uh, it's, 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 it's dedicated, <laughs> but yeah. the, I'm not sure whether you were uh, with us from the beginning where uh, mm -hmm. Nikki Ioannou was presenting this uh, technology, but she said that Keve is going to announce some uh, uh, funding opportunities. So uh, this is maybe something uh, you'll be interested in. And uh, I'm going to keep uh, track. I'm, I'm going to stay in, in touch with, uh, with uh, Nikki and mm -hmm. see if uh, there is any opportunity. Uh, we could collaborate as well. Uh, we could come up with new ideas. So yeah. It was uh, very interesting. Thank you again, Michalis. Uh, last uh, question from the audience, something, anything? No? Okay. Uh, Michalis, can you please stop sharing your screen because uh, we need to make yes. space for the next speaker. 
Uh, according to our schedule, uh, now we were supposed to resume from the break. So we are almost 15 minutes late. So let us have a break of 10 minutes instead of 15. And uh, we will resume at uh, 10.55. So Irododos, uh, you will be starting uh, 10 minutes later than planned. I hope this is not uh, something uh, difficult for you. No, no, that's fine. Uh, we have another commitment at uh, 11.30, but we have plenty of time. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yes, okay. Right. Thank you very much. Sure. So resuming in, uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, coming back from our break. I hope everybody is still here. Uh, so uh, I hope we're all this here. <laughs> okay. Yes. So... Uh, Herodotus uh, will now present uh, a more, let's say, scientific-oriented uh, presentation, uh, which is entitled Data-Driven Applications for uh, Optimized Sea Traffic Management. Uh, I think it is in the context of uh, the project that Michalis presented earlier. So uh, Herodotus, uh, you have the floor. Oh, well, thank you, Andreas. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my, I'm an assistant professor at the Cyprus University of Technology and the technical coordinator of the STEAM project. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here since I get to present uh, a brief overview of various data-driven applications that we have developed uh, as part of the STEAM project for optimizing sea traffic management. Now, sea traffic management is a fairly general concept uh, that entails a set of procedures and systems for guiding, monitoring, and in general managing sea traffic uh, with a very simple goal to ensure efficiency, safety, and environmental sustainability of the shipping industry. Now, the shipping industry itself has been going through uh, an evolution, even revolution, one might say, over the last five, 10 years towards you know, digitization. And it's been driven mainly through two forces. Rodolfo, One is, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Uh, yes. We do not see your screen. Uh, you do not? Uh -huh. no. Your uh, screen sharing is paused. Yeah, maybe that? something uh, needs to be approved. Ah, there we go. Yeah. How about now? Yeah, perfect, perfect. All Thank right, excellent. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. All right, so the, the two driving forces behind this uh, evolution or revolution of the shipping industry is first, there's a drastic increase in the number of interconnected smart devices, uh, you know, containing sensors, which are of course collecting real-time data from ships, from ports, from various services and so on. And then two, uh, there's a lot of mature big data analytics platforms that now make it easier than ever to process and analyze really large scales uh, of data. So these forces are uh, renewing and introducing new intelligent data-driven applications that affect the port, the ships, and the transportation itself. As there's a variety of applications for ships, such as you know, automatic fault detection of equipment, uh, preemptive maintenance, and so on. Uh, with regards to ports, uh, you have collaborative decision-making that Michal has mentioned earlier, this automatic birthing and a few other things. And of course, you know, with regards to the transportation itself, there are various applications such as route planning and optimization, uh, various safety enhancements, environmental monitoring, uh, and so on. So in this presentation, I'll actually discuss several of these that we have uh, uh, acquired good experience over the last years. So let's start from the transportation aspect and more specifically from one of the most important enabling technologies in the field, that of automatic identification system or AIS. So AIS is an automated tracking system that vessels are using for transmitting various information over VHF. That information uh, could be about the ship itself, such as you know, its ID, its name, its type, its size, as well as dynamic and voyage information, such as its current position, uh, its speed, where it's headed, uh, and so on. Uh, AIS actually mandatory equipment for uh, all large cargo and passengers vessels. And as you can imagine, 
is one of the most important source of information for all the stakeholders that are involved in maritime relate, related activities. And this is something we recognize very early on. So we have developed a, a platform for consuming AIS data. Uh, at this point, our platform uh, consists of three main sources. We have our own uh, station installed on the Tofis building for getting AIS data, but we also have access to uh, a government stations as well as uh, stations from a private company, Dorofeo. So all of that data, now we're receiving the data, we're decoding it and storing it locally at the university, uh, at our service at the data center. Now there are you know, a, a few key challenges involved in this process. First is the volume, uh, and I would say the velocity uh, of the data itself. We are currently correct, collecting on average 1 million AIS messages per day uh, from ships covering most of uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Now, as you can imagine, and because of the multiple sources and the different types of messages, there's a lot of effort that we have spent on how to integrate all of this message, how to do the duplication. Uh, and also we've spent a lot of effort on data clean. Uh, and there are two aspects of data cleaning. One is uh, with me the messages itself, you know, they they're coming over uh, radio waves. So a lot of times we may get incomplete messages out of order or corrupted messages and so on. So it's, we have to deal with those. Uh, but there's also information within the message itself that might be dirty. Uh, a, a key example is the destination field, right? Where the hit is ha headed. Uh, this is information that's actually entered manually uh, by the ship crew. There's no standard uh, way of doing that. And therefore, uh, a lot of times, you know, there's, uh, there are, uh, misspellings, there are random punctuation marks, there are various inconsistencies in the way that they're presented. So one of the, the early problems that we had to deal with was how to, go, to clean uh, this type of uh, dirty destination fields. So we have developed uh, an approach that's uh, running in real time in our platform. Uh, this approach is based on a fuzzy matching uh, approach that we're trying to essentially uh, understand and resolve these dirty destination uh, strings into clean, uh, well-defined ports around the world. Now, on top of the AIS uh, you know, uh, storage that we have, uh, we've built a ship tracking intelligence platform that anyone can access from ais.cat.ac.cy. Uh, there we can visualize uh, all this uh, useful information that we're collecting from AIS in real time. We can generate, we can visualize uh, a list of the data in decoded clean form. So we can see, you know, right now what's going on. We have ships, where they are, where they're headed, their speed, location, and so on. Uh, we can also generate uh, various reports and interesting analytics, right? So we can see you know, how many ships are out there, how many ships per type or per location, uh, and so on. And of course, we also have uh, a live map for monitoring the traffic around Eastern Mediterranean, mainly around uh, Cyprus. Uh, we can drill in, we can visualize uh, information about the ships, uh, we can track their course, we can filter, uh, and so on. Now, with AIS, one of the uh, important aspects, or I guess one of the important goals, I would say, of the AIS technology is to improve safety in uh, sea navigation. Uh, for that, we've actually we also developed yet another platform for AIS, uh, a vessel monitoring and warning platform at uh, aisafety.cat.ac.cy that can generate real-time alerts for vessels entering or leaving various areas of interest. For example, maybe a ship uh, has just entered some area that's uh, been protected or there was uh, some issue, there's a hazard area and so on. We can get a real time notification for that event. Uh, we also can generate alerts from potential vessel collisions based 
again on how the vessels are navigating uh, through the seas. Uh, there are other uh, applications that we can develop using this information. We can detect speed deviation based on the course of a vessel. Uh, we can monitor for any unplanned stoppage uh, of the vessels, which could indicate some issues. Uh, this information that can be useful for search and rescue operation. Truly, the the level of applications here uh, it's uh, quite immense. So. Uh, with the STEAM project, we were able to really take advantage of the AIS information and generate various platforms so that we can implement various very useful uh, uh, applications for it. So next, I want to move into the port itself and talk a little bit about the uh, port call data collection and systems. Now, a port call is the process of a vessel arriving and getting served at a port. Now I'm going to show you here the, the general setup at the uh, port of Limassol, even though, uh, but uh, this setup is actually fairly common in all the ports uh, of the world. So there's a central uh, port community system that's used for you know, gathering information related to port call data. Uh, this data there that are entered by the shipping agents and the customs, marine police, the health department, they all have access to that data. And of course, the three private companies, uh, PO, Eurogate, and TP World, that you know, manage the, the traffic and the loading and loading operations at the Port of Limassol, they have their own systems and they interact with this uh, port community system. Now, one thing that's missing from this picture uh, is the real time sharing of information between all the actors themselves, right? There's a lot of cases where you know one company needs to contact the other. Maybe there's a, a ship delay somewhere. Maybe a crane got busted and it's down for maintenance, which would delay some other ship, uh, and so on and so forth. And right now, everyone is relying on emails and, and phone conversations. And there's no good way of exchanging this information in real time. So as uh, Part of this project and a continuation of the port collaborative decision-making platform uh, that was developed in the previous STM validation project, uh, the in, some industrial partners of the STEAM project, namely Todoceo and its subsidiary marine fields, have developed uh, Perseus. Perseus is a cloud-based port call data sharing platform uh, that focuses on the real-time uh, data exchange between all the actors uh, at ports. And it's mainly focused on collecting timestamp information. So this is information related to you know, estimated and actual times of anything that has to do with the port call, of when the vessel will arrive at the ship, when it's gonna go to the berth, uh, moving in and out of the port, going to Anchorage and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of information here for tracking and planning everything that's taking place in a port. And the correct management of this information will lead to just-in-time operation, right? In, in very simple terms, that means everyone has the same information. So the vessel knows when the port is ready to accept it. So it will arrive just in time to get accepted. At the port, everyone knows exactly when the vessel is going to arrive. So they're going to uh, you know, quickly guide it and into the berth. There, the cargo operations can commence and everything can work as efficiently as possible. So this is the, the ultimate goal, essentially, uh, of a port to achieve just-in-time operations across all possible levels. Now, based on all this port call data information, we can extract various information uh, related to uh, the evaluation of the port itself meaning that we can use this information to compute various key performance in the indices that will tell us how good the, uh, the port is doing, how good the various actors are performing. And of course, it will help us identify uh, where the issues are, right? So another uh, industrial partner of the project, Delevan, has developed these Power BI dashboards for visualizing key perform various key performance uh, indices. 
uh, that have to do with the uh, you know, pre predictability or punctuality of the vessels, uh, utilization of the port and so on. With this dashboard, now we can slice and dice in various ways all this information, which will allow us to uh, you know, understand what's going on, find out you know, you know, causes that might be leading to delays in the port or inefficiencies in the port, which of course in turn will allow us to go back, well, the key actors to go back uh, and improve wherever is needed the, the procedures or the systems that are involved. All right, so now drilling down into the port and more specifically into maritime container terminals, there are a variety of scheduling uh, problems that are uh, very relevant and very uh, important to deal with. Now in a maritime container terminal, there are actually uh, three categories of operations. There are operations taking place at sea site, at the marshalling yard, and on the land side. And each one of these category has an array of different scheduling problems that uh, a port needs to deal with. For example, on the sea side, you know, uh, we need to the, the port needs to, you know, allocate berths and QA cranes for loading and unloading uh, vessels. At the marshalling yard, we have the problems of, you know, scheduling again the the yard cranes, scheduling the tracks, the movement of uh, the containers from the vessels to the storage area. Uh, and when we move to the land site, now we need to uh, interface with the land operations. We need to schedule the tracks, how we're gonna load the, uh, uh, the containers onto the tracks uh, and so on. So as you can see, there's an array of scheduling operations that all need to sort of uh, cooperate and take place together. Now, from these projects, we have uh, initially focused on the birth allocation problem, uh, which deals with assigning berthing positions to our arriving vessels at the port in order to minimize the total handling, the, uh, the total cost of berthing, uh, which uh, in essence means that we want to minimize the waiting time of the vessels, we want to minimize the handling cost, and we want to minimize, of course, late departures. Right, so in the, in the simplest version of the problem, right? So we have a list of vessels that are expected to arrive, let's say tomorrow, right? So for every vessel, we know the estimated time of arrival. We know how many hours it will take to load or unload its cargo. We know what time the vessel has to depart the port. Uh, we may also know its preferred birth location, where exactly it wants to birth, uh, as well, of course, as the dimensions uh, of the ship. So the goal now is to generate a schedule, a two-dimensional schedule that will decide at which time and at which birth location each vessel needs to birth. Right? So uh, as you can imagine, there are various constraints that need to be satisfied here to make sure that you know, uh, everything gets served as quickly as possible with minimum delays uh, in, in the entire uh, scheduling process. So to address this problem, we've actually developed uh, a, an approach based on the Cuckoo Search algorithm, which is a meta heuristic uh, computational intelligence approach for generating this two-dimensional problem. Uh, we can guarantee a near optimal uh, scheduling allocation of births uh, to vessels, and we can do so uh, within uh, milliseconds of computation time. And uh, moving along to the, uh, I guess, the third dimension, uh, I've already mentioned that environmental sustainability is one of our key objectives. And to achieve that, we need to start first from collecting environmental data. Now, collecting continuous water and air uh, monitoring data is very crucial because first, it can help identify the source of uh, potential pollution at the port or near the port. And uh, at the same time, we can also use it to measure the effectiveness of various uh, environmental measures. So for this purpose, we've uh, developed yet another platform for collecting data from uh, various sources. We're collecting data from 
monitoring stations that the university owns and that we have already deployed uh, within the port and around the port. Uh, but we're also collecting data from the Cyprus Meteorology Department, as well as the Department of Labor Inspection. Now, the, the data that we're collecting uh, involves uh, meteorology data, such as you know, temperature and humidity, air quality data, such as the level of CO, CO2, dust particles, and so on, as well as water quality data that have to do with the, the salinity, the chlorophyll content, various oil uh, detection, uh, and so on. So all of this data can, visual, can be visualized at the CAT air quality web interface at airquality.cat.ac.cy. So this interface allows someone to uh, visualize, get, get a list of different types of monitoring data at different locations and at different points in times. Uh, there's gonna be a map for visualizing this on a special temporal way uh, and so on. Of course, this is just the, the first step in our environmental uh, monitoring and management plan. There's a lot more uh, that we're planning to do and we're actively doing uh, in this front. And with that, I would like to thank you everyone for your attention and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you, Irodotos. Uh, very, very interesting presentation. You have done a lot of work uh, and uh, I, I have the impression that, uh, that you open a new roads for uh, continuation, for uh, exploiting the potential of this uh, type of uh, data processing uh, for the ports, for the maritime industry, for uh, pollution, air pollution, environmental, and so on. So, um, yes. Uh, any any other question from the audience? We have uh, we are a bit behind, ten minutes behind. So uh, we're gonna take only a couple of questions. Anybody? No. Uh, I have a slightly technical question, Erodotos, if I may. Uh, I I noticed that you have a two D dimensional uh, uh, graph uh, depicting the um, possible position of the ships. So, uh, do you take into account, yeah, that one on the right, yeah. Do you take into account also the difficulty in maneuvering between already uh, part, let's say, vessels for a new a newcomer to go and park, for example, if the system says that uh, the position, the optimal position is between uh, two, four, and nine, do you take into account the fact that, for example, if uh, uh, number five would be would, would supposed to be parked there, there is no room for it to navigate through and, and pass through two and nine in order to, do you have any such constraints in order to make it more realistic and, and, and find, let's say, a more practical application of this idea? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good question. Uh, at the moment, uh, we did not consider that, but it's definitely something that, uh, that we could constrain. We can add it as a constraint to our mathematical formulation. Uh, of course, that has to, you know, it depends on the layout of the port, if and where there are such constraints. But we can definitely, I mean, I, in my mind, I think it's not very hard to specify that as a constraint. Let's say, you know, in this berth, if there's something parked, then that, then we cannot park on you know these slots, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can put that as a constraint, and then the Google search algorithm or whatever algorithm is used for uh, scheduling can take that into account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, is there any question or remark or comment? Just one question, please. Yeah. Yes, Andreas, please. Hello, uh -huh. very interesting presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, that in, in, in order to reconstruct a missing information, you utilized uh, a fuzzy approach, something. Uh -huh. I tried to find the relevant uh, paper, but without success. Can you please provide it? Yeah. 
if it's uh, available? Sure. Uh, I think I have it on the. Uh, it is available on the Steam website ah, okay. uh, in, under publications, and I, I have the the reference here: employing fuzzy matching for clinical. Fuzzy matching. Okay. Yes. You remember also that we were talking about. I'm not sure on what occasion. But we were talking about utilizing fuzzy cognitive maps. Mm -hmm. uh, Andreas is, is uh, one of the guys that uh, have utilized uh, fuzzy cognitive maps in his uh, PhD thesis. So uh, I, I think most probably he's uh, going towards the same direction, thinking about how we, we could utilize uh, fuzzy cognitive maps in, in this uh, context. So we are going to talk about this uh, at the later stage, mm -hmm. uh, I see a lot of potential uh, in, in, in multiple contexts within your project. But let's leave it to discuss it uh, in, in privately. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks again. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Please uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Uh, now we are moving forward to presenting some uh, applications. Uh, which um, uh, are part of uh, undergraduate or graduate diploma thesis at the undergraduate level of our department. Two of these uh, will be presented back to back from uh, our students. Uh, so Masni Giriotis, the next uh, presenter, we will talk about uh, uh, automated machine learning, uh, a practical approach to what uh, automated machine learning uh, could or should be. And then uh, Vasus Haralambos uh, will uh, talk uh, a, a bit more in a general context about how uh, IoT can uh, be utilized and smart data processing can be um, applied uh, in, in different contexts, in smart buildings, smart cities, and so on. Then we will have, we will, we will going to have two more presentations um, the one by Andreas Christoforou about uh, how to process data uh, from the hotel industry and, and make it uh, uh, quote unquote smart tourism application. And finally, we are going to close uh, with uh, Panayotis Christodoulou, who, who is going to introduce us to smart specialization, smart decentralization applications, uh, an introduction to how blockchain can be utilized in smart data processing. So, uh, I would like to call uh, Thomas. Thomas, are you with us? Perfect. Yeah, hi. Excellent, Thomas. Now, can you please show your screen? Uh, these uh, talks are uh, 20 minutes long each. So uh, I would like to call all the speakers to respect this time limit because we are already a bit behind. Uh, so Thomas, you have the floor. So hi, uh, as Mr. Andreas said, I'm Thomas Gidiotis and I study electrical engineering, computer engineering and informatics at the Cyprus University of Technology. And I'm in my last semester and I'm doing my bachelor thesis with Mr. Andreas. And now I will present you uh, my, my system uh, of, uh, of my thesis, which is a practical approach on automated machine learning. So we are going to, to see the target of the system, some basic, some basic information about machine learning. Uh, then we will see the process to be done to, ta to take the result from a machine learning algorithm. Then we will see what is AutoML, uh, yeah, and what the automations can offer. Uh, after this, to understand the whole process of AutoML and what is the difference from uh, machine learning. Uh, we are going to see one picture as example for the model building, and after that we will. Uh, and then after that I will represent uh, my system and the methodology that I follow to build this system. And finally, a short demo of the system uh, that is not completed, but we are about to finish it uh, as well. So the main purpose of, uh, of the system is to offer automation. We want uh, to absolve the user for making all the steps alone and trying to see if the way that he did them is optimized. 
Uh, another one point is that uh, with uh, automation, all possible models for a data set are being checked. So we take performances of all models and we know which is the optimized. So the one with the best performance, we choose the, the one with the best performance. Uh, we save the time of the user because the process uh, is automated. A uh, user don't, don't need to give attention so he can do whatever other work he has until the time uh, the system want, uh, want to, to calculate the optimized uh, model. And we try to absolve unexperienced users from difficult tasks. Uh, that uh, the steps that are difficult to, to calculate a model or to, to run on a model, a data set, or to make the, the data set clear, uh, which is time consuming and the higher risk of failure and error if a user is uh, unexperienced on these things. So machine learning is a study of computer algorithms which can be improved automatically as new data coming on it. The, the data that we have is called data set and it's a set of values that we know and it's true and it's true uh, which is given into the model and the model learn from them. For example, if you give it one data set which, which contains classified uh, records of data, the algorithm can learn how to classify the records. And then if you give it a new record, the algorithm can classify it based on what it learned before from the data set. Uh, in another way, you probably want to predict a value. So you give to the algorithm the data set with a number of records which all of the, them contain the predicted value. So the algorithm will learn how to predict. And again, if you give one record of data, you can take back the predicted value for the specific uh, data. Uh, the whole process of machine learning, uh, that's the steps to do uh, to find the, the best model in the algorithm. Uh, you have to find the question, your problem. Uh, that you want to ask the, that you want to answer. For example, if the patient with blood test has a cardio cardiovascular disease, then you have to clean the data, which that means uh, that you have to see the data set and check for empty values or zeros and try to fix the, the data set. Then uh, you have to visualize the data with graphics and then you write the, and train the model you want. Then you run a, a test data set to see the performance of the algorithms, which means that uh, how good uh, the model is to predict or classify uh, a, a, a record that you want. So the definition of AutoML is automate machine learning which is the process of automating the task of applying machine learning to real world problems. Uh, the automated task that uh, AutoML offers is to clean the data, to find the best model based on our data, to evaluate the, the results on, uh, on another test uh, data set, and predict or classify all our data as uh, at once. So, we don't go to predict um, record by record our data, but we can give a CSV file so we can, uh, so the system can uh, predict or classify all of the data as an automation. So here we see the, para uh, the picture of the automated model building, how the model um, is building during the time. We give our data set we make some configurations to, to tell the system that uh, we need uh, these models or we don't need some models. Then uh, all the models are going to, to fit on our data set. And then uh, we check for the best model. model. So the, the system uh, come up and say uh, to us that the best model is this with that with that performance. So, to our system, 
our system has uh, has classified predict algo algorithms. Our system has classified and predict algorithms, so it can predict if a patient has a cardiovascular disease, and it can classify the patient to two classes: the one of them who has the heart block problem, and the other who don't. Uh, in addition, we have forms so we can run only one record at a time, and the CSV option to run multiple records at a time at once. Um, furthermore, we we have implemented an ML algo algorithm with the help of TPOD, which is an extension of Python. And we provide the option to download the optimized model as a Python code, or we can run, as I said before, a CSV file, and the system give us back the an CSV file with the prediction or classified data. Uh, finally, we provide the user with the performance of the model and which model is the best to know. Uh, our methodology that we follow was to make a good research about machine learning. Uh, then we have to learn the different type of algorithms and what type of machine learning they are classified. Then we did our own models based on data set which contain data about cardiovascular diseases. And then we make a, made a research about auto, uh, automated machine learning and we did the system. And here is a small video that uh, I will show you the system, but I want to mention that it's not uh, the final system and it's not as user friendly as it can be. So here is our uh, first page of the, of the system. We provide the user with some information about AutoML, uh, the pipeline of, of AutoML, the automation that is being doing the system and why, uh, and why it's good to, to use it. Um, let me... Uh, Here we see uh, our options. We have the option for to run models. In uh, in this option, we have we can run our own models. Here the data, the two data sets that we have and the two algorithms that we we implemented, and we can run on on these data sets. And we have another uh, option for AutoML to start the automated process. Um, so, yeah, if we click on the automated process, just a second. Ah, here, here is uh, our form uh, based on the first data set. And uh, below you can see that we have a CSV file, CSV option to give a CSV, CSV option. Um, then we'll go to see the, the other sector of our system, the, the AutoML. So here we choose uh, which which of the class of models we want to to do we want to classify we we put classy we put the option for classifiers and if we want to predict something we put the the option of regressors and then we choose the data set that we want to give to the system and find the optimized model on it. Uh, when we, we when we submit this to the system, we have to wait. Uh, we have to wait uh, one or two minutes to to run all the models on the all the models of classifiers or regressors on our datasets on our on our dataset, and then the system will show us the the score of the the score of the dataset, the performance. And we can download the model 
as a Python code, or we can choose a data set to proceed and give data to this model and predict or classify our data. Uh, so that's not for me. Have you finished, uh, Mas? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, just to say that, um, of course, the issue of uh, uh, machine <coughs> learning auto ML is uh, quite uh, big. Uh, it is quite complicated. So our intention with uh, Thomas' uh, thesis uh, was to investigate how feasible it is to test uh, a variety of models in an automatic way so that the system uh, is able to suggest to the user the most appropriate one. And um, by increasing the number of available models, uh, you also increase the uh, computational burden on, on how to uh, suggest how to come up with the more most uh, appropriate model to suggest to the user. So uh, I think uh, the whole area is uh, purely research uh, oriented and uh, in my opinion could lead also to uh, a PhD degree. But our intention was uh, much simpler than that just to investigate the potentials, the difficulties, the challenges, and have a proof of concept of what automated machine learning can be. So uh, if we don't have any other questions, uh, I would like to thank Thomas once more and pass the word to Vasilis. Uh, Thomas, please stop sharing your screen. Um, good morning. Um, Hello, please. Yes. There is one question for Thomas in the comment in the chat box. Yeah. Just to mention. Yeah. So can you? Yeah. Question to Thomas. Uh, ah, yeah. From where Lambros, is yeah. the web application developed? Uh, this is a yes. question from Lambros. Uh, so Thomas. Please, uh... Uh, yeah. The the application was developed uh, on the Python interface and especially on uh, one extension of Python, uh, which is called Django which allow you to, to use HTML, CSS, JavaScript, as we know from web development, and run uh, Python codes uh, with, the, with the functionality and all, the, and all that the Python has. And uh, we, we try to, to use many ex extensions of Python as teapot and uh, yeah, this. Yeah, that was my assumption actually, Thomas. That's a very good work. Uh, I was assuming that you use Django to combine uh, AutoML uh, functions with Python and the Django is a very good framework to um, adapt uh, to Python libraries when you are developing web applications. Great yeah. work. We agree. Thank you, Thank you. Lambros. Any other question from the audience? No. Okay. Uh, Vasilis, you have the floor. Lovely. Let me uh, share my screen. Can you? Uh, can everybody see the? Yes. The start of the presentation. Lovely. Well, good morning again. My name is uh, Vasilis Havelambos. I am a student at the Cyprus University of Technology. And uh, I'll be presenting smart data, IoT context, and its applications, um, and mainly my thesis under Professor Andreu. Lovely. And well, first off, I'll, uh, I'll start off by explaining what artificial intelligence of, uh, of Internet of Things devices are. Um, AIoT is the technology of connecting Internet of Things devices to perform artificial intelligent decisions or predictions to create a smart environment. Um, some basic examples of AIoT are smart homes, as we see now with Alexa, 
um, we can communicate through with voice recognition to Alexa to turn on and off our air conditioner or any other tasks. We have wearables, smart cities, and smart industries. Um, my initial idea for this AIoT project was uh, a city traffic light system controlled by IoT cameras to minimize conjunctions and traffic jams. Um, the idea was to have heat map or cameras on each traffic, traffic light at a certain junction, which can calculate how many cars are coming from the one side and how many cars come from the, from the other side. And um, with this information, we can calculate when the lights should be green or red for each side to minimize conjunctions. Um, another idea we had with AIoT was counting cars. And I mean by having a small device placed on a, placed on a certain route in the city that could count how many cars pass over this device. Um, this information, we could, with this information, we create a map in concurrence to time, meaning we can detect how many cars go through this certain route at which times, and we could help out with community services, like, for example, garbage men. We could tell them that at this time, 3 a.m. in the morning, no cars pass through this specific route, so it'll be better to do your task at those times. And the final idea we had was a smart building um, to create a small network of the IoT devices in a building that could collect various data. And we mainly went with the idea with RFID tags to keep track of items as a small example. So the target, the original idea of my thesis was to create an IoT network that could be monitored from a single web application on the same network or externally. The IoT devices will be Raspberry Pis communicating on the network via MQTT, collecting various data from sensors. This data can then be collected, analyzed, to produce AI predictions or artificial intelligence model training. Uh, the, co the project will be considering an office or school building environment, meaning it will not have a large scale and the data that will be transferring will be on a small network. Um, what I mean about the web application being on the same network or externally is for the project, the web application will be on the same network, um, but it could be produced to have the, the web application on an external server that could collect the same data and be able to be viewed from wherever. The technologies I'll be using for this project, um, I believe it should be built on the MQTT protocol. MQTT is a data transferring protocol via IP that is lightweight and more fitting for IoT communication. The server and client program from the MQTT protocol will be coded in Python. Python will also be used to collect and organize the data from the sensors of the Raspberry Pi. Um, the, web, the MQTT protocol um, is a publish and subscribe protocol, meaning that one IoT device will publish data of a certain topic, and we have another IoT device, or in this case, the web server that will be subscribed to that specific topic. The subscriber will receive the data, be in the client program, and the publisher will be the will be sending the data, be in the server program. Um, these both can be coded in Python, which I think is better as well, because Python has better libraries to communicate with GPIO pins for receiving data from the sensors that are connected to the Raspberry Pis. The web application will be coded in PHP with the Laravel framework. I chose Laravel as a more familiar with this framework and it's easy to create a model view controller type model and have it respond with a, as a REST API, meaning that the server will not respond with views because we don't need views to be responded to the to the IoT devices if they need to collect data from the web server, but it can be responded as a REST API with JSON data that is more human readable and easier to, to transfer through the network. The database I'm going with is InfluxDB as it's best fitting for storing time series data because the Raspberry Pis and the IoT devices will be sending data in pulses. For example, every five seconds, certain data will be collected, which is time series data, and InfluxDB is better for this data. The network construction. The network can be easily connected in an average size building over Ethernet. Each connected Raspberry Pi can communicate to the web server and listen for messages. And the messages, I mean, being subscribed to a certain topic. Each Raspberry Pi will publish messages that the web server will be subscribed to. 
the messages will be data from the connected sensors and they're stored on a separate server with InfluxDB. Uh, the Raspberry Pis can be powered with uh, power over Ethernet, meaning their placement in the building can be as flexible as possible. Uh, power over Ethernet is, as you all know, just gaining power over the Ethernet cable, so we won't need any batteries or any power supplies to the Raspberry Pis, and as I mentioned, can be flexible in their placement. The collected data and examples. It's still uncertain what we could actually create with the data, but we consider that the project will be flexible enough to let the end user create any artificial intelligence model with the collected data, meaning the user might have an idea of how to utilize this data to collect, and we can leave that to his or her imagination. We'll also be able to use motion detectors on the IoT devices that can alert for any movement in the building after closing hours. This is obviously as a security for security reasons that could collect that could alert the user with the web application um, when movement is happening in the office building after closing hours. RFID tags can be placed on various building items with their own ID and can be monitored for theft purposes or general whereabouts, meaning we can have at the end of each door of a room a RFID reader that can scan different devices that leave or enter the building so we can know where their whereabouts are in the building or if the devices actually leave the building altogether then obviously an alert can, can be placed that an item was removed from the building without authorization. Heat maps can be also be used as motion detection but we decided to use heat maps mainly as a device to alert for too much motion in crowded areas meaning a room we can specify the data from a room as having too much too many people at the same time and that could be that could be an alert as a COVID risk. Um, we, we thought about a mobile application that uses its phone's NFC to detect how many students are entering the building or are entering a certain room. Um, we can create a simple mobile application just to send data through the NFC of the, dev of the, of the mobile device that a student can scan before entering the building. And this data obviously can count how many students are using the building or if an unauthorized personnel is using the building. Um, any of the above can send alerts for emergency evacuation of the building. And collected, we can collect room temperature of a certain room and automatically turn on and off the air conditioner. This helps for a finan uh, financial benefit for the university. And also it can be used to turn off, automatically turn off air conditioning after closing hours if somebody forgets to turn it off or if nobody is using the room. Um, in general, we can collect lots of data about the room usage, e.g. we can use different rooms if one is too crowded. For example, if, this, if a certain room is being used 10 times a day and the room next door is only being used once, we can balance out the usage with the provided data. So in summary of the whole thesis project, um, a bunch of IoT devices connected to the same network, sending data from the sensors to a central web application. The user can have its flexibility, like mentioned before, to create and analyze anything with the stored data. And the end goal of the whole project is to create a plug and play service where the user can add extra sensors or extra Raspberry Pis to the network and configure it all from the central web application. Um, projects like mine theoretically are easy to create as a concept, but are still not yet reliable security wise and have not been tested on big scales such as smart cities. Personally, I believe AIoT will become a very common subject in the future and will be something humans will have difficulty living without. And for a university project like this, it can prove to be beneficial as the data collected can improve the university's financial gain, as mentioned before with the air conditioning, but also can consider students' health through this COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. I'll be accepting questions. Thank you, Vasilis. Um, any questions from the audience? Asilis tried to uh, put in place uh, quite a few ideas of how to use uh, IoT, uh, modern technologies, uh, sensing, collection, processing, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, to uh, have data processing serving uh, needs, applied real-world problems, such as the ones uh, Vasilis mentioned earlier. 
on pandemic and COVID restrictions, uh, uh, conformance to measures, to health measures, mm -hmm. to um, locating and tracing equipment, moving around from uh, room to room or from building to building. Uh, so this is work in progress again. So Masilis just uh, described the context of his thesis, uh, mostly the ideas, uh, the technologies, uh, and the approach. Uh, is there any question for Vasilis? No? All right. Thank you very much, Vasilis. Thank you very much. Uh, moving now to our next uh, presenter. Uh, which is uh, Dr. Andreas uh, Christoforou. As I said before, he will be presenting uh, data, smart data processing in the uh, pillar, in the, in the, in the uh, application domain of tourism and the hotel industry. So uh, Andreas, can you please share your screen? Yes. Okay, you have the floor. Okay, hold on. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Andreas. Um, firstly, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Andreas Stoforu, and I am a postdoc researcher at the Software Engineering and Intelligent Information Systems Research Laboratory. Uh, my presentation revolves around the case study of big data processing, and particularly data from the tourism industry. Okay. In the beginning, I will make a brief introduction to the idea, and then I will make a short reference to the definition and challenges around big data. Next, uh, I will reference big data processing architecture and see how this architecture can be applied to data from the tourist industry. And Finally, I will introduce an online application for collecting, processing, and visualizing data from Cyprus tourists. Uh, this presentation themes is based on a study done by Mrs. Polixenik Seru in the context of her undergraduate thesis. Of course, um, during this, this uh, work, uh, Polixeni getting too deep and um, process uh, ma many aspects of the theme, but I had to narrow it down to fit in a 20 minutes presentation. So I will present only the major and uh, more important th <coughs> uh, things. Uh, this project deals mainly with big data and the related challenges, where at the end summarized in a relevant uh, application. Okay, as I said before, the big data topic is not the main topic of this presentation. So I will give only some major notions and definitions and just to make the connection between theory and application. Big data in short are massive data sets that are coming from uh, different types of sources and can be analyzed uh, in a computational manner to provide insights uh, that could lead to a better decision. Uh, just to say that the chart on the left side indicates uh, the amount of data produced each minute on the cloud. Uh, the number here refers to 2020. So I assume that these numbers one year after at least have double or triple, I'm not sure. Big data main objective is to provide decision support through a well-established process from the collection of the data to the presentation uh, of the final results. Uh, the rapid growth of uh, the volume and the rapid growth of different types of data, along with the transition from traditional software architectures uh, make this field um, an attractive, but at the same time demanding research field. Although big data field still faces many challenges, at the same time offers great opportunity towards uh, an efficient and reliable decision support. Okay. <clears throat> 
this we can say it's a simple representation of the big data processing workflow. Um, the available data can be divided into two major categories. They are structured data that can be found in many types and formats coming from het <coughs> heterogeneous uh, sources. Uh, any kind of uh, data from the internet, uh, text files, uh, media files, and so on and so forth. The other category consists of data coming from software systems such as ERPs, CRMs, uh, conventional and traditional uh, RDBMS, data warehouses, etc. And, and the next stage, <clears throat> that is uh, the data collection, followed by the pre-processing stage, which is uh, responsible mainly uh, for data cleaning, data transformation, data normalization, uh, management of uh, missing values, and uh, maybe some uh, other uh, processes. Of course, uh, the pre-processing procedures are applied having in mind the problem under study and the objectives that have been set uh, from the beginning. Uh, after the pre-processing stage, the data are stored in a big data storage able to support the big volume and the different types of the available data. And uh, one more characteristic, uh, but uh, equally important, is that the kind of database should provide fast and effective search capabilities. So to be available for the next stage. The next stage is the data analysis. Um, I can say that uh, data analysis constitutes uh, the cornerstone of the big data process. The real value of the final results is up to the effective uh, application of the data analysis. And, and finally, the last stage describes the way that the final information is available for use I mean, through reporting, visualization, uh, APIs, mobile applications, uh, etc. Now, um, on a higher level, this schema represents the application of big data processing workflow that we saw on the previous slide on data coming from the tourism industry. These are some of the sources from which we can extract data from the tourist industry. Uh, data, data sources uh, can be so, uh, data from tour operators, data from hotels like reservations, availability, historical data of uh, customers, um, current fleet and capacity from uh, uh, rental uh, companies, scheduled flights from uh, airways, and uh, many, many more. Uh, once this data becomes available, many approaches and techniques uh, coming from the area of AI or CI can be applied to analyze uh, this data, to classify the data, ident identify hidden patterns, and at the end come up with meaningful and valuable information that can be used for different kinds of uh, applications, such as um, targeting high level of uh, hotel occupancy, targeted marketing through the profiling of the customers, uh, targeting a stable and increased number of uh, visibles, uh, repeaters, and so on, um, providing accurate forecasts for, for the incoming travelers, for example, and, and also increase the customer satisfaction and improve the customer's loyalty and many, many more applications. Uh, the application design developed from for uh, that act as a case study developed from scratch and some uh, some of the features and characteristics are that is an online application and it's able to collect process and visualize uh, tourist data. Uh, the application simplifies the data management of various types coming from multiple sources. Uh, it's a user-friendly environment, and it offers uh, various ways of data collection and visualization. 
Uh, unfortunately, the application is down, and um, so I cannot make a live demo. So I took some indicative uh, screenshots for the demonstration. Uh, let's proceed to the first. Here we can see, uh, I have to say at this point that uh, mainly besides the pre-processing, the storage of the data, the collection of the data, that uh, totally applied on this uh, application. Um, toggles the, this application mainly toggles the data visualization in order to come up with uh, data representations and uh, data visualizations to the, to the end user. Of course, the end user could be a key person of a hotel, uh, of, of a property or uh, a stakeholder from the tourist industry. Okay, the first uh, the first feature that uh, I, at this point I have to say also that um, the data are coming from two sources mainly from a Cyprus tourist organization that um, store data on the uh, government open data portal. And uh, the second source is uh, an API we found uh, that can provide uh, data from uh, booking engines uh, and prices for many uh, locations, uh, areas, and uh, hotels. Okay, here the user can uh, use the dedicated filter and select uh, to see the, in the numbers and the of incoming travelers per year, per month, and per country. As you can see, uh, the data are visualized and can easily infer that, for example, UK is the major uh, tourist uh, provider. Uh, also, in this uh, screen, we can see <clears throat> that the user is uh, able to choose to select uh, a country and for this specific particular country you can see how uh, the incoming travelers come from this country uh, spread in, into the whole year month per month month by month uh, and it's a, also a comparison uh, chart that you can see how the things are going uh, this year compared to the previous year and so on also, incoming travelers, um, I think it's uh, almost the same as uh, before. Uh, here we can see, uh, again, incoming travelers uh, on a visualized way, uh, data for a specific country. Uh, per, uh, no, it's, uh, this is data, uh, compa uh, comparison data from two different countries uh, per month. And proceeding with the next uh, slide, we just uh, depict um, the available uh, hotels uh, that uh, data are stored in uh, this system and uh, are ready for, to, uh, for a presentation. Uh, the end user can select uh, one on uh, many hotels that uh, are interested to see uh, information about them and to check some analytics, uh, like uh, to see the prices uh, for a specific date range, for a specific type of room, com to compare the prices between uh, uh, hotels and between uh, booking engines. Uh, also here, you can select uh, as many hotels as, of course, are available to compare the prices between them. Uh, one can see the benefit of this because uh, you can see your prob how your property stands uh, again, uh, against uh, the competitors. You can uh, be helped to make some decisions based on the contracts you made. Uh, with the booking engines and so on. And, um, okay, uh, 
continue with the, re with the next slide. Uh, these are comparative uh, reports per, uh, per price, per agent, per hotel, just to show the capabilities uh, of the system. Uh, I don't think that uh, there are many we can see here. Uh, just uh, I want to know, to highlight that these are just few of the many uh, features that uh, this application offers. And of course, uh, I can say that uh, this application is not a, a ready for market application, but uh, it used uh, just as a case study, just to show uh, how the theory can be applied in a particular uh, sector. That's all for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andreas, uh, for the presentation. Uh, as you mentioned, this is uh, another uh, demonstrator, a pilot case, a proof of concept. Uh, which um, combines many different aspects, such as um, connecting to open data, uh, retrieving data from uh, multiple sources, uh, cleaning data, uh, processing data to make them uh, usable. And then once you have the data, which is the first challenge, then you can do as many combinations, as many queries, as many um, searches uh, as you like to, um, at the end of the day, come up with a meaningful information so that the last part is a sort of system of deep insight, which is uh, one of the two constituents of this uh, school. So uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, any questions from the audience? Any comment, any remark? Okay, so Andres, please uh, stop sharing your screen. And uh, I find the button for stopping sharing. Yeah, uh, if you uh, press on, let me see. Uh, you you should see if you if you move your mouse, you should see uh, the button. For some reason, I can only see the the attendees. <laughs> Nothing else. Uh, okay, so maybe Spiros, can you can anybody can you interrupt? Uh... Professor Andreas, hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think if I'm gonna start the sharing, it may be. Ah, you may you I, may. Uh, I'm yes, blue, uh, Andreas Green and. Uh, okay. Okay. So yeah. I this uh, tried. No, no, basically, I, you cannot start sharing while the other is sharing, so I cannot yeah, share. Yeah, that's my message as well. Uh, Spiros, yeah. uh, you, can you keep... Yes, I try now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now it okay. resumes to the, yeah. the, the normal... The, 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 uh, the, the, the application. So, uh, now, Spiros, yeah. Excellent. Okay. All right. So now we have only one uh, presentation to conclude the second day. Uh, as I said before, it's an introduction to smart uh, decentralized applications and will be delivered by Dr. Panayotis Christodoulou. Panayotis is a lecturer at the Neapolis University of uh, Paphos, but at the same time, uh, he's a postdoc and research associate at our lab. So, Banayotis, uh, can you switch on your camera? Yeah, yeah. Can you share your screen? Got it. All right. Yeah, you can see your screen. Now it's okay. Uh, yes, can you switch on your camera as well? Yeah, basically, because I'm, I'm using the web version, I think I can only do the sharing and not the, the webcam. I'm not using the Zoom software, I'm just the web uh, application. Okay, you don't have the Zoom uh, downloaded, you mean? Yeah, because I'm here at the uni now. So, uh, hello everyone, my name is Panayotis Christodoulou. As Professor Andreas said, uh, I'm a lecturer at the Department of Computer Science located at Neapolis University in Paphos, and at the same time, I'm a postdoc researcher 
and the Software Engineering and Information and Intelligent Information Systems Lab, located at <clears throat> Cyprus University of Technology. My main interest, uh, research interests, are main are focused on the blockchain technology. And today I will make a brief introduction to decentralized application. First of all, of, uh, first of all, we're gonna start uh, with the blockchain, uh, a promising technology that everyone is talking about. As we can see here, some recent uh, media post, uh, PayPal recently launched uh, cryptocurrency trading. Other big organizations such as Citibank uh, reports that the Bitcoin price can skyrocket to six uh, digits uh, range in uh, 2021. And other institutions are basically analyzing and focusing on cryptocurrencies. So uh, blockchain is a promising uh, emerging technology. Uh, as you can see here in this uh, figure, based on the open source maturity model, uh, two years ago, blockchain was at uh, stage three, uh, through of this illusion and stage. At this stage, basically, only just 5% of the Perusha audience has adopted this new emerging technology of blockchain. Nowadays, and due to the fact that a lot of companies involved in blockchain have successfully raised venture capital funding to expand their businesses and their products, who are moving from stage three towards stage four, which is the slope of enlightenment. The reputation of the technology is continuously rising. And now the main question is on how this new emerging tech blockchain can benefit the enterprise and become more widely understood and widely used. Here I have also another one graph that shows the growth of the blockchain uh, technology from its early years up to 2025. Now in 2021, as you can see, where the mainstream usage in the upcoming years, more progress will be conducted. And until 2025, blockchain will be in a more mature stage. Nowadays, uh, as you have also seen in the news, Tesla have uh, adopted cryptocurrencies. And now you can buy basically a Tesla car using Bitcoin. Other organizations decided to pay their uh, employees in blockchain. So as we can see nowadays, we are in a more mature level and we have reached uh, the mainstream usage of um, blockchain and basically uh, cryptocurrency. But let's see first, what is actual blockchain? Blockchain can be described as a worldwide ledger and it's basically a decentralized database that exists over a P2P network and has specific protocols and rules. One thing about blockchain is that no one knows who invented blockchain. The idea for it came from a paper published some years ago from an unknown author that was called Satoshi Nakamoto. And the aim of blockchain at first was to solve the double spending problem. So as we know from the mainstream usage of the internet, but in the 90s, a lot of trials were conducted in order to create a digital currency, but all uh, trials uh, were failed due to the centralized nature of the database that they were using because it was, the database was vulnerable to attacks. Satoshi uh, proposed a solution, the blockchain solution, in order to solve this problem using P2P, a P2P network, and he successful managed as we can see 10 years later, he successfully managed to propose a solution that can offer traceability, transparency, trust, security, and basically it was adopted firstly as a payment method, but nowadays due to the introduction of other technologies, we can basically develop any application that we want on a blockchain network. Here we can see the two more popular public blockchain networks. The one is the blockchain, 
has already uh, before it was introduced but in 2009 by Satoshi Nakamoto. It's a cryptocurrency and a worldwide payment system. Bitcoin was the first, the world's first blockchain application. So by the introduction of the blockchain, we had the introduction of the blockchain uh, system. Bitcoin can work without the need of a centralized authority. It's fully decentralized. And this is due to the nature of the P2P network that basically conducts and Bitcoin. Besides Bitcoin, we have the second most popular network is, is Ethereum. It was introduced six years later than Bitcoin. For Ethereum, we know the creators, it's Vitalik Buterin and Kevin Wood. And basically Ethereum provided the opportunity to developers to deploy smart contracts on the P2P network. And this gave the opportunity for the design of decentralized applications. Let's see now what are smart contracts. Basically, smart contract is not a new idea. It was an idea proposed by Nick Jambo back in the 90s. Basically, smart contracts are programs that consist of rules that can be checked out manually. And if certain conditions are met, the rules are executed and recorded on the blockchain network. So when you deploy a smart contract on a blockchain, you get a contract address. Address. So each smart contract has its own contract address. So a user can call a function of the smart contract by sending some data on the contract address. And if the data are correct, and also the person that will execute the, the function has the privileges uh, to execute the, the function, the transaction will be recorded on the blockchain. It will be publicly available. And so, uh, so anyone can go to the smart contract address and view all the transactions that were made on the, on the smart contract. And this is good for transparency and traceability purposes. Now, the main focus of the today's presentation is to present uh, some decentralized applications. Nowadays, decentralized applications we have developed and designed and developed in various uh, domains of applications. We have decentralized applications for the medical domain, for the supply chain and logistic domain, for the real estate, IP rights protections, etc. Soon, in the upcoming years, basically uh, every do domain uh, or uh, every company uh, will run its own decentralized application. Let's start with the medical decentralized applications. The challenges that we are currently the domain is currently facing uh, are several. Basically, there is not currently a tool that ensures the integrity and security of medical data. There is not an application that can be used in order to provide specific access to specific users for viewing your medical record. And also, we have the challenge of fake medicines. So in the dark web, basically, there are uh, fake medicines, uh, so no one can know if this medicine uh, is not fake. How blockchain can help? First of all, with blockchain and the development of decentralized applications, patients can choose with whom they want their medical data to be shared. Also, once the data are shared either from the doctor to the patient or from the patient back to the doctor or uh, to some, uh, uh, someone else, the medical data cannot be modified. So even the patient that owns the data cannot modify the data. So let's say for the COVID test, if you get the data that a patient is positive to the test, uh, even if he owns this data, he cannot modify it, and modify it using the blockchain. Also, anyone can verify the authenticity of medicines and the authenticity of medical certificates. By taking this into account, several applications we are uh, designed by various organizations. Some examples are the medical chain and the IDANDE. Basically, IDANDE is a company behind the development 
of the medical disabled application that is being used from an RIT or hospital in Cyprus. Now let's move to a different uh, application domain. It's the supply chain and the logistics uh, domain and the development of such application, applications in this domain. Also, this domain faces several challenges. We have the lack of transparency as the product moves along the supply chain. And also, there are a lot of issues in product authenticity, etc. Blockchain can help by creating and distributing a ledger of shipments, let's say, to ensure the integrity of the process. Also, a decentralized application, while as the data are, are being reported on the blockchain, can be used for securely monitor the progress of goods and for the verification of authenticity of partial goods. So, as you basically every day we are using several uh, e stores, we are buying products, but at the end of the day, uh, when we're going to pick up the product, it may not uh, look exactly the same as the product that we ordered. So there is not a way to ensure that this is the partial goods. Blockchain can help, uh, can help towards this direction. Some examples of such applications were developed by some of the biggest uh, logistics and supply chain companies uh, worldwide. We have the DHL application and the MARS application basically <clears throat> are using this, this, this central application are basically uh, using their own distributed ledger of shipments. Uh, this is a definition that they have created, they are using to ensure basically integrity, security, and verification. <clears throat> now, let's see how blockchain can uh, revolutionize the real estate domain. Again, here we have some challenges. We have the lack of transparency of ownership information, and also we have many fake property titles, fake documents, and so Blockchain can help by providing a shared distributed ledger that can enable better decision making. So before making a, a decision to buy, let's say, a property, you can use this distributed ledger and uh, make the correct decision. Stakeholders, so stakeholders can be either the, the buyer, the seller, uh, or the agent, or the authorities, etc., can interact with the transaction history of this distributed ledger or basically can interact with the ownership information in a more secure manner. So let's say we have a property title that was instead by a stakeholder, the authorized authority on the blockchain. And so any other uh, interested party can view uh, who is the owner and the previous transaction, the previous prices uh, of the, uh, or estimation of the prices of the, of the real estate property, etc. Blockchain, by, by doing this, blockchain can automate the processes, and this will lead to the cut out of several costs that are currently being paid either by the seller or the buyer. Some examples that may use of blockchain is the Dubai Land Registry. Basically, the Dubai Land Registry has one of the, let's say, most of optimal solutions, decentralized application. Uh, so if you are in Dubai and you are interested in buying a property, you can view all the information in a distributed ledger. And then basically you can also pay in cryptocurrencies. And once you have paid, uh, the property title now will have your name and also other authorities, such as the electricity authority, the water port authority, etc are automatically uh, informed, and basically they also update their records. So instead of going to the electric, electricity authority with the <clears throat> with your contract, let's say the rental contract, and they ask from them to uh, move the 
electricity meter on your name in order for you to pay the bill. This is done in Dubai automatically, and this is how blockchain helps the Dubai land registry. Another one example here is uh, the Probe example. It's a marketplace uh, where basically uh, you can list the property for sale. You can uh, pay uh, or get paid in cryptocurrencies. And also this uh, probably application here has its, its own and distributed ledger with all the formations of the buyer and the seller recorded on blocks. Last one is the IP rights and domain. Uh, the challenges that this domain is facing is based on the poorly maintained IT systems and decentralized databases that can cause unnecessary legal disputes because uh, either the IT systems or the central databases are not updated in time, uh, so this can lead to legal disputes. Blockchain can, can serve as a platform which provides accurate and clear inform uh, information of the owner of the IP asset. Also, uh, the timestamp can be recorded on the blockchain and a timestamp can indicate the exact recording time of an idea. So let's say you have an idea and you, have to, you want to share this idea or record this idea in, in a blockchain network. So in the future, when someone else comes with uh, the same idea, you can defend yourself by recording the time of an idea and the uh, description of the idea on a blockchain network. Also, blockchain can be used to verify the authenticity of IP documents. One example of such uh, decentralized applications is the, is the Bernstein uh, DAP that basically uh, is used as a, a platform to provide accurate uh, data that uh, were are being recorded on the blockchain. Also, on the Bernstein application, you can uh, create your own record and uh, make a transaction and record your idea on the blockchain. In the upcoming schools, because this is the first school of the destiny, in the upcoming schools, uh, I'm going to show you live transactions and live data that are coming from the various blockchains. So we have the blockchain explorers. If we move, if we go to navigate to uh, the Bitcoin and blockchain explorer or the Ethereum blockchain explorer, etc., we we'll get a real data feed. So in the upcoming schools, we are gonna make a presentation. It's not gonna be more uh, theoretical as this one, but it's gonna be more practical one. And uh, basically, we are gonna see live data feeds that are coming from the various blockchain networks. Also, my aim in the upcoming school is to create, a, a basically show a live demo of decentralized applications. Nowadays, uh, we have the NFTs uh, trend, and basically it's digital art and digital visual graphics and paintings that have been recorded and been stored in the blockchain networks. So in the upcoming school, I'm gonna have a live demo of such application. And my aim, my final aim is, be, is, is to show you on real time how you can create and develop your own smart contract, deploy it on the blockchain, and interact with it in real time. So basically, this is some of, of my aims for the upcoming schools. Thanks for your attention. Feel free to ask any questions you like. Thank you, Banayo. This uh, it's a huge area. It's a huge topic. So remind me to keep a whole day for you. <laughs> and you are yeah, yeah, basically for the for the, <laughs> for the next uh, school, basically I will need uh, two times so at least. <laughs> at uh, least I will I will allocate yeah, it's gonna be more and more a practical one. It's not gonna be a presentation. It's gonna be real. Yes interaction with the blockchain at the same time and uh, so Yes, but I mean the, the, the uh, potential of applications, especially for smart data processing, uh, the whole uh, spectrum is huge, it's really huge. Yeah, 
it's huge. Basically, uh, if we go to a blockchain application, because everything from block zero, which is the genesis block, up to the number of blocks that we have, let's say in Bitcoin, that is uh, millions of blocks, uh, everything is recorded. So from there, you get you can get a real time feed. And also, you have all the formations recorded on the blockchain, so you can imagine uh, that is a huge uh, data set, uh, and you can interact with it uh, in real time and get uh, back uh, uh, some results, etc., and do your analysis. So it's, it's a huge, uh, the same data, uh, so you can call it now, uh, data gen gen generation. Yeah, data, data processing and metadata generation. Yeah. Okay, uh, any question, other question uh, or comment from the audience? Okay, thank you again, uh, Manayodi. Thank you, Professor Andreas, for the opportunity. Okay. So uh, we have come to the end of this uh, second day of uh, the first uh, online school uh, on smart data processing systems of deep insight. Uh, I will officially close uh, today's sessions and hope to see you all again tomorrow with us. Uh, the program is on our website. So please feel, to, please feel free to consult it and uh, see what other interesting presentations we have for you uh, tomorrow. Thank you all for being here. See you tomorrow.